Hello and welcome to another episode of the Bitcoin Standard Podcast. On today's podcast, we have a special guest coming back for the third time, the one and only Michael Saylor. Having basically bought up all the Bitcoins, he's here to tell us <laughs> about the, uh, what he thinks of the Bitcoin market, how things are going, his expectations for the way going forward. Then we're going to also discuss my new book, The Fiat Standard, which Michael had an um, enormously important role in um, helping me develop and finalize into the final book. So, Michael, thank you so much for joining us. Thanks for having me, Safe. So, I guess a good place to start is just your general uh, ideas about the Bitcoin uh, space and the Bitcoin market and the developments since the last time we spoke. We spoke, I think it was for the last time we spoke was, I think, in February. It's been now almost 10 months. So, it's been a while. Um, so, a lot has happened. Has but it been that long? February? Really? Was it February or March, April? Okay. Anybody remember? Yeah, Something a lot like has that. happened. Okay. Yeah, a lot has happened. So yeah. um, I, I, I presume your bullishness is still intact. <laughs> yeah, so you want my summary for the past six months? Um, yeah, and uh, I mean, if you've, whatever you find worthwhile. Um, yeah, well, I mean, I think if we just focus upon what's going on, the China crackdown took place, the hash rate moved uh, to the United States. You know, we, we drew down to, you know, 80, 85 exahash, and now we're back up hitting all time highs again. So I think the, the overall mining network has redistributed itself and, and further decentralized itself. And there's been a Western drift of the Bitcoin network. So I would say geopolitically, we saw Bitcoin drift West. And I would say um, economically, and uh, that's all been a good thing. I think, I think we've seen a substantial Western embrace of Bitcoin since uh, May, even. Um, if we look at the political winds that are blowing, clearly there's, um, there's a lot of support. There was a fear, I think, six months ago that we might have uh, government antipathy toward Bitcoin in the West. You know, you heard the most informed criticism was, you know, Ray Dalio's, well, it's so good, someone's going to ban it. I say, like, it kind of, first it was, well, I don't get it. I don't like it. It's bad. And then it became, I guess it's not bad. And then it became, well, I guess it's not going away and it works, but it's just, it works too well. Then it became a Jamie Dimon, Ray Dalio. It's just too good. Uh, you know, even, you know, Frank Gistra, eventually everybody kind of revolved around or settled upon the the narrative that, yeah, it's not bad, it's good, but it's too good, and that's why I'm afraid of it. And um, I think in the last six months, right, we see, in fact, the opposite's happened. The administration's in favor. We've got supporters of Bitcoin in the administration. I, it seems to me like Biden was a positive check. The entire set of administrative regulators are positive checks. Uh, most of the noise around regulation is really just the altcoiners, right? The DeFi people, the security token people, the staking protocols, the, you know, stablecoin issuers. And, um, you know, they, they want to generate a bunch of noise that, uh, that regulators are hostile. But I can't see any activity in the past six months from a regulator that was, in my opinion, uh, hostile to Bitcoin. Um, I think that uh, the politics right now are such that you have kind of have crypto versus Bitcoin. You have all the all the altcoins versus Bitcoin, and and generally, uh, generally, uh, if the altcoins could drag Bitcoin into the debate, right? If it's bad for the altcoin, they want it to be bad for Bitcoin so that all the Bitcoiners will support their position. So I think you see a lot of that where people will try to recharacterize utterances by regulators as being bad for Bitcoin when in fact they're not bad for Bitcoin. They're bad for security tokens, DeFi exchanges, unregulated crypto exchanges, NFTs, or something else, but not Bitcoin. I think the other dynamic you see here is a little bit of tension between the entrepreneurs that control the industry in the first decade and the institutions coming in the next decade. <clears throat> like, um, 
everybody in the world agrees that digital currency is a good idea. I mean, the Chinese want digital currency. I think every country wants it, even the US wants it. We just can't agree on whether or not you should be an FDIC and you know chartered bank to issue it and whether or not, what, what are the licenses you need to issue a digital dollar versus, um, versus um, uh, anything else, versus an analog dollar. So I think there's a lot of noise that's all about, uh, all about will the entrepreneurs continue to be able to do business unfettered or will they need uh, to come public, right? Is it public investors or private investors? Is it public companies or private companies? Is it chartered banks or techno entrepreneurial banks? Is it onshore or offshore? Um, I think that uh, in the past 30, 30 to 60 days, the, the thing that's surprising to me is actually there's so much general support for everything in Congress and the Senate, right? <laughs> you know, the narrative was they're going to ban it. I think that I, I think my observation is they don't want to ban anything, right? Like, which, which is which actually means that you have um, you have the administration in the middle. You have the politicians on the far, you know, the far, uh, what is the word, uh, liberal side. And then you kind of have uh, a Bitcoin maximalist on the other side, which is, which is uh, to my mind, interesting. Um, I think that the volatility in the market right now is, is because Bitcoin is still conjoined with the rest of the crypto industry. Like as far as I can see, the people driving the market uh, in the near term from day to day are large pools of hedge fund, hedge fund capital and investor capital, highly leveraged, fast money that's cross trading Bitcoin versus every other altcoin offshore and in DeFi with huge leverage. And their time horizons are one minute to one week. Like for example, if you look, if you look at um, minute by minute trading patterns of Bitcoin versus ETH, they're trading uh, in lockstep almost uh, every sixty seconds. Like you'll see, um, you'll see a dump in the market in ETH, and it'll be reflected in Bitcoin in thirty seconds. And so. Um, uh, that's interesting. And I've seen uh, that correlation going on for a while, uh, irregardless of news. And uh, of course, I think that a lot of people have a lot of money and they have a lot of leverage, right? You can trade with 20x leverage. You can trade in theory. If you, you know, if you cross collateralize through a DeFi exchange, you know, you could trade with even more than 20x leverage. So there's a lot of fast money with a lot of leverage trading across the CFI crypto exchanges and the DeFi exchanges. And they've got, you know, Cardano and Dogecoin cross collateralized to ETH. And it, and it seems pretty clear to me, someone's got a big block of Bitcoin tied up in ETH, in the ETH network. And when ETH trades down, Bitcoin's trading down almost like they're, they're a fused currency pair or fused asset pair. And they couldn't unconnect that. That they can't uh, dis. Uh, what is the word? Disintegrate that in the near term. Over the long term, like months, quarters, years, yeah. But in minutes, hours, and days, it seems like there's a lot of integration there. So, you know, what what do I think in general? It's like obviously I'm bullish on the asset class. It seems to me that that uh, we've got remarkable consensus that Bitcoin is digital property. We've got market remarkable consensus that Bitcoin is the one universally accepted commodity. We've also got a consensus growing that everything else is a security, by the way, safe, <laughs> which is, yeah. I, if you roll the clock back 12 months, I think it wasn't clear, but I think right now out of 6,500 cryptos, I think that you might have a debate over 12 of them being property and it looks like everything else is a security. And, and if you're not, 
if you're not a proof of work coin, if you're a proof of work coin that's a fork of Bitcoin or something like that, maybe there's a debate about whether it can be property. Half of them aren't, half of them are. But everything that's got an ICO, everything on proof of stake, everything related to DeFi, all, you know, all of the functional coins, all the staking tokens, it's pretty clear the view of the regulators is if it's if there's staking involved, it's a security. If there's DeFi involved, it's probably a security. Right. If there's a central organization, if there's a venture capitalist involved, it's a security. If there's a central development head, it's a security. Right. Any of those things are, are securities. And uh, I think I think uh, a lot of people don't want to embrace that reality, but that is kind of the reality. And so, so we're in this very interesting tension where, where uh, what should theoretically happen is most of the altcoins should disappear or they should, you know, probably they should be to disappear. A few should become publicly listed, privately listed security tokens with disclosures and different rails. A lot of the entrepreneurs should uh, should exit, right? They get squeezed out of the market. A few entrepreneurs can come public, like cross the chasm. Can you get an FDIC license in order to issue a stable coin, right? That kind of stuff. Can you actually get the appropriate license? Can you hire the right lawyers in order to get through that chasm? And some do, but 98% don't. And, you know, what's... What I see coming from the president's working group and all the all the regular, if you read the the stablecoin memo, if you read the denial of the spot ETF, if you read the Crenshaw memo, which was issued by a commissioner of the SEC, Caroline Crenshaw, and if you parse all the testimony of the regulators in congressional hearings and public speeches, the conclusion you come to is. <laughs> There are two things that are acknowledged that the world wants. One thing the world wants is it wants digital dollars, stablecoin digital dollars, and it wants 10 trillion of it, 20 trillion of it. Like we've got a $160 billion stablecoin market, you know, with Tether and Circle leading. But what the world really wants is it wants 10, 20, 30, 50 trillion of it. I mean, they want to replace their lira and their pesos and their, you know, every, every currency in the world, they want to flip from local currency to dollars and they want to go from analog dollars to digital dollars, right? I don't, I don't trust the peso or the lira, so I want the dollar, but I don't trust the bank, so I want it out of the bank, right? So, so if I were to go and interview a thousand people on the street in Africa or South America or Asia, and I said, would you rather convert your local currency to the U.S. dollar? And would you rather have your local your your dollars in your hand versus in your bank? I think that you'd have like 90, 95 percent, 90, 98 uh, percent consensus that everyone would rather have custody of their own currency and they'd rather have the strongest currency in the world. And the U.S. dollar is the strongest currency in the world for two reasons. One because you can trade cross borders, right? You can trade between Lib Libya and Lebanon and Turkey and Paris and the US with the dollar. And you can't do it with the CNY or the Euro or the local currency. So, so it's the cross, it's the worldwide global medium of exchange. And the second reason they want it is because it's losing value the slowest. <laughs> I mean, maybe there's like two or three, I don't know, maybe the Swiss, you know, franc or something. There might be two or three currencies that look a little bit stronger, but it looks like you've basically got currencies pegged to the dollar. Yeah. And then you've got currencies getting weaker than the dollar at a, at a gradual rate. And you've got currencies getting, by the way, you've got some getting weaker to the, do to the dollar at a gradual weight that's shielded by capital controls. Like, I think the CNY is getting weaker than the dollar, but there's capital controls, so it's not so obvious. It's pegged, but with capital controls. And we, and we know, like, the Argentine peso is pegged with capital controls, and, well, and it's still getting weaker at a rapid rate. 
right? The 100 pesos to the dollar is the official rate. 200 pesos to the dollar is the unofficial rate. And it was 20 pesos to the dollar 36 months ago. So I think what you see is the dollar is setting the standard. Everybody pegged to the dollar that's got no capital control. They're just weakening at the same rate. The ones with weak capital controls are weakening 10% faster. And the ones uh, and others are weakening 20, 30, 40, 50% faster, and they're literally collapsing. So that's the currency story. Everybody wants digital dollars and they don't trust their banks. And then the property story is, and this is not uniform, right? I think that smart people that are informed know they want to swap out their weak property for strong property or their weak asset for strong asset. But there's a lot of debate there, right? So you know what, what I would say. I would say every property is weaker than Bitcoin. So sell your real estate, sell your equity, sell your bonds, sell your gold, sell your silver, sell your commodities, sell your collectibles, sell everything, buy Bitcoin. But um, generally, uh, not everybody fully understands that. I don't know, we're two, three, four, five percent into the education and, and safe. Everybody, everybody in the world understands that the dollar is better than their local currency. There is, there is not a debate. Uh, 1.5 billion people in China, everybody in Brazil, everybody in Argentina, everybody in Africa. So I'm, I'm, I'm sorry to tell you, but unfortunately, I know from Lebanon, there is significant debate about this. People have maintained the idea that their lira is going to be recovering against the dollar as the lira has gone from 1,500 okay. to 25,000. There's still people delusional enough to say, oh, 25,000. Well, this is clearly oh, undervalued now, and we're going to come back to 12,000. Okay. Like, I, I I'll defer to you since you're you're on the ground there. I may, and I will I will retract my statement. I'll state it fine. Absent extraordinary patriotism, you know, idealistic patriotism. Brainwashing is another word for right? it. Right. Most the great, let's just say even like 80%, right? The great majority of people, absent the patriots and the idealists, know that they'd like to swap out their weak currency for a strong currency. On the other hand, there's a, a lot of debate in the US or you know, in, in other markets about, do I want to hold the S&P index or do I want to have a second investment property or do I, I want to own some gold or do I want to own commodity baskets? Now, let's come back to the whole point though. I'm talking about regulators. If you parse very carefully Gary Gensler's public statements, no less than five or six occasions, he said two, there are two things that stick out two things that are very important, maybe three, three things. I'm going to reduce the last, you know, everything that's been uttered by the most influential regulators in the world to three things. One thing, Satoshi's innovation is real, which is another way to say, we have created truly decentralized digital property in cyberspace that is not owned and controlled by any company, any individual or any government. We have common property, parapasu to gold or land or commodities. That's the first innov innovation, right? The immaculate conception, as we like to call it yeah. here. And it's another way of saying, if I understand securities law, and if I understand law, and if I understand finance, then I will acknowledge that you can create digital property, assuming that you have a fair, permissionless network without an ICO or a central party or an investment contract. So we know that Bitcoin has done it. It may theoretically be done again by somebody else, maybe a fork of Bitcoin, right? You could probably your best argument would be a fair fork of Bitcoin now. If it were to fork right now, then maybe the thing that was created could also be deemed as a uh, property. I'm not saying it would succeed right like might not you know here's here's your best idea what if the if the chinese government forked bitcoin and then made it illegal to use the first fork but the second fork they kept in china you know and then they didn't interfere with it any other way and maybe if elon musk forked bitcoin in mars and you had mars coin china coin and bitcoin and all three of them started from the state of the network right now. And then they had some geographic political reason to be separated. 
and you could hold that China wall or that Mars wall up. I mean, there's nobody in Mars, right? But if there was, right? If you could do that, then maybe you have another digital property, right? <laughs> maybe. And uh, I, I'm gonna, I, I think that's the, the bar first- The is set for altcoiners, basically. This is what you gotta do. <laughs> that's a good way to say it. Satoshi set a high bar, but that's the bar, right? That's the, the, the Bitcoin standard is the Satoshi standard is a, is a fair distribution without an ICO, without intent to profit on the efforts of others that is just a, a community property, right? So that's the, that's the first uh, thing to take away, the second utterance. Um, the, you know, to be able to trade 24-7, 365 at the speed of light with zero friction is useful in the world of commerce. That is to say, um, I think that uh, I think that Gensler recognizes, and I think any fair, a fair regulator, or economist or politician recognizes that there's a benefit to be able to move stuff at the speed of light, friction free, twenty four seven, three sixty five. The digital digital transformation of the economy or fintech, if you will, and for that to manifest itself. Uh, effectively right now, you need uh, a digital dollar, right? You need a digital currency. And I've said before, why? Because there's 100 million companies that have collectively invested trillions and trillions of dollars in accounting systems and installed those systems over 30 years so that they can trade with each other. And be because of the inertia of the accounting systems, the systems inertia, the corporate inertia, and the existence of nation states, it means that it is either illegal or impractical for, for all, the, all the economic actors to not trade in currencies. So um, as long as the EU and the US dollar, the US exist, and as long as the US dollar and the Euro are legal tender, and as long as companies like SAP and Oracle run the accounting for Disney and McDonald's and Pfizer and and the US government and the payroll, et cetera. As long as that happens, then you're gonna use dollars and euros. But what we know, what we recognize is that um, not being able to move them on the weekend uh, with a computer is holding back the worldwide economy. You know, even today, just about every day, I pick up the phone, right? And then I have to approve wire transfers. <laughs> Like this is a 30 year old way to move money around 30 years. So, so we, we still have a situation where it's very challenging to move, uh, to move currencies as a medium exchange. So the second thing that everybody wants is they want the digital currency and they want, they want a small amount of local currency, digital rupees and digital pesos and digital Nayara and digital, as long as there's a nation state that exists, you need a small amount of that, hold it for a day, right? Uh, digital boulevards. And then they want a larger amount, like a month worth, a month to a year of uh, digital dollars. And then they want, then after that, what you want is you want something to hold a lifetime, digital property, right? So. So um, I think that uh, the first observation is digital properties and innovation. The second observation is we need digital currency and people need to trust this stuff. And nobody trusts stable coins right now issued by entrepreneurs offshore, right? The, the never ending tether FUD, right? Never ending, right? And, and, you know, tether is an entrepreneurial company. I'm glad they exist and they exist to meet a need. And if my choice was to have money in a bank in Afghanistan or hold tether dollars and, you know, on my phone, then I would prefer the latter than the former. It's pretty obvious why they exist. But, but if JP Morgan issues a trillion dollars of, of stable coins, it'll be good for the industry. It'll be good for the world. At the point that, uh, that you have a public Silvergate Bank, a publicly traded bank, they just raised five, $480 million last week, by the way, right? A publicly traded bank with an FDIC license that issues hundreds of billions and then trillions and then tens of trillions of dollars of US dollars. That's the bargain that it takes for the US government to trust the, to trust the coin moving. That's just, that, that's the expectation they have. And 
it's not an unreasonable one because there's no way that Facebook or Google or Am Apple or Amazon will ever move trillions of dollars of stablecoin around from Tether. It won't happen, right? And there's no way that you will see Microsoft and Amazon and IBM and Pfizer do cross-border payment remittance unless it comes from, uh, unless they have access to a stable coin from a Bank of America or Citigroup Group or whatever. So if you're looking for the big use cases for, uh, for these things, you're going to want to have massive amount of stable coin for all for for global remittance for payments between 8 billion people and for the 100 million companies to trade with each other. So that's the second observation. And the, and the third observation that you get over and over again, is um, most everything else is a security. Right? If, if the you know, if, if there's an ICO, and it was issued in, you know, in expectation of earning a profit, and it is a small group of people. If we're depending on the efforts of others, it meets the meets the definition of an investment contract security. So, what we're waiting for, right, is clear guidance about if you if you're currently owning securities or you've issued one, what do you do next? If you're trading them, what do you do next? If you want to issue a stable coin, what do I have to do to get to a stable coin? And that creates a a lot of regulatory uncertainty and overhang. If you're if you're a crypto trader, if you're a DeFi exchange, if you're a security token, all of those. But where is there no overhang? If you just want to, if you want to own Bitcoin as digital property for a hundred years and hold it as a store of value, it's crystal clear, right? Uh, it's not going to be banned. It's not even banned in China. I mean, per official guidance, the Chinese don't want you to trade OTC. It's a capital control issue. They have this issue with mining Bitcoin, which is, is, is silly, but I have yet to see a bright line edict in Chinese that says you cannot own digital property. They haven't said it. In fact, they've said the opposite. And um, everywhere else where there's regulatory, regulatory action, it seems to me that it's all touching on stablecoin issuance, stablecoin transfer, it's issue. It, it's touching on tax. It's touching on securities laws and leverage. And uh, you know the the frustration of the of the other token holders and the entrepreneurs is obvious and high, right? Um, and I think that uh, that Bitcoin suffers due to the volatility that's induced by being conjoined by literally. Like there might be billions of dollars of Bitcoin that's actually linked as a trading pair as collateral to ETH. And every time it moves, everything is moving up and down, literally second by second, minute by minute. And, uh, you know, it's like it's illegal to trade with 20 to X leverage on the NASDAQ. It's illegal, right? But but in fact, what you have in the other crypto markets is 20x, 100x leverage, and you can cross collateralize that stuff. And, uh, you know, it's it, the regulators have yet to give clear guidance. I think they don't really want to, they don't want to crash the market, right? I mean, they, they could literally crash the market, but, but um, I think that that's a 36 month thing safe. So I don't know if that helps. Yeah. Yeah, yeah I think it's uh, it's very astute what you said that uh, the alts are trying to drag Bitcoin into this. And I think, uh, you know, your average altcoiner is usually out there complaining about Bitcoin consuming so much energy and Bitcoin is uh, boiling the oceans and... Um, Bitcoin's outdated and we don't need Bitcoin and we need to move on. And, uh, you know, just yesterday I saw some guy from um, one of the most centralized uh, uh, crippled um, <laughs> uh, 
uh, shit coins, which I won't name uh, explicitly, making a proposal for how to um, advance Bitcoin by moving off proof of work in order to reduce electricity consumption. Yeah. So they're always, uh, you know, the, 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 they're always so concerned about Bitcoin. They need to change Bitcoin, and they think Bitcoin is dead, and they want you to not invest in Bitcoin because they want you to join the gains until the regulators come about, in which point they start getting angry at Bitcoiners because, you know, Bitcoiners aren't supporting us and Bitcoiners are uh, cheering on the SEC and Bitcoiners are um, being statists. And uh, it, it's pretty uh, it's pretty interesting. And I think that you also see that as well from the um, from a lot of the organized lobbying. I think um, a, a lot of the uh, D.C coin people, um, their modus operandi is to try and get, I mean, no, nobody lobbies for Bitcoin. That's the thing. Very few people, um, like if you get Bitcoin, you realize it doesn't really need you to lobby for it much. And you realize there's a very high opportunity cost for investing in lobbyists and you'd rather just stack sats with it because Bitcoin is clear. You know, it's, it's, it's very clear that it, as you said, um, the, Satoshi's sure. innovation is real. The immaculate conception, it wasn't a security. There was, it, it was obvious it wasn't a security. It was just a digital form of property that emerged organically on the internet. Nobody controls it. So there's no point behind wasting money on lobbying, but there is a lot of uh, incentive for uh, altcoin to spend a lot of money on lobbying because it's very clear that their altcoins are securities. And so there's a lot of incentive to try and bundle in the altcoins with uh, Bitcoin in order to try and pass it off as, and you know, everybody wants their altcoin to be part of the small number of alts that are like Bitcoin, you know. Well, you know, ours is decentralized, ours and Bitcoin are decentralized, but all these other ones, you know, let the SEC uh, tear at them. Um, I'm also wondering, what do you think in terms of, I think, um, in a sense, like the, the 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 attack on Bitcoin, many people, many Bitcoiners have been pretty paranoid about the idea that governments are going to attack. And it seems, you know, uh, e even the China thing, as you said, yeah, they banned the mining, but they haven't banned ownership, and they haven't they haven't thrown anybody in jail because they own Bitcoin. You know, they haven't criminalized it. It's not like owning cocaine; you're not getting searched and arrested for it. You. Um, but it seems to me like you know fiat world is fighting back in a sense by perhaps um you know people who are from the fiat world they just I, i'm not saying this is kind of a conscious conspiracy it's just intellectually they think of it as um you know the fiat coins as the altcoins because they're centralized they allow us to do more tricks they uh, allow us to have more leverage they allow us to have uh, more credit, more uh, financing. It looks to me like that is kind of the attack on Bitcoin. Like um, people who are um, not excited about the prospect of hard money and escaping fiat are thinking of, you know, boosting all the uh, non-Bitcoin coins. And like you think of somebody like um, Elon Musk coming in and choosing to pump Dogecoin. Um, I think that's not entirely unrelated to the fact that, you know, the, a lot of people coming from traditional finance are um, in the fiat mindset of money needs to be controlled by a group of people. Well, I, mean, I think that if um, the Bitcoin community just embraced the idea that uh, Bitcoin is digital property and it's going to coexist with digital currencies issued by the United States or Europe, or China, then 99% of all of the resistance and friction just disappears completely. And then you, what you realize is your debate is, is with gold and your debate is with real estate and your debate is over whether you should buy the S&P index and it just becomes an investment decision. And then everybody that doesn't want to own Bitcoin because they want to own Apple stock just looks like they like Apple stock, right? Like if you want to invest in a, in a VC venture, if you want to invest in a hotel, if you want to invest in a stock, if you want to invest in a collection of Picassos, these are all just different investment decisions that you made in lieu of buying Bitcoin. If you characterize it like that, then it becomes a lot less uh, controversial, a lot less heated. And... Uh, just step back and let and let the battle of the currencies take place between the currencies. I mean, the real the real battle right now is between the dollar and the peso and the naira and the RMB and the you know et cetera, all the currencies. And 
And uh, there's no reason, if Bitcoin doubled every year for the next decade, it still wouldn't be but a small fraction of the money in the world. <laughs> so for the next decade, we could simply be good citizens, watch, uh, watch digital property grow from being one out of 500 trillion dollars, right? We're one at one five hundredth of the property in the world or something like that. Why not just become 20% of the property in the world, become 200 trillion, you know, if we're 200 trillion and there's a thousand trillion, right, we'll be 20%. So at the same time, like if I'm gold, it's like the gold people, they want us to agree that we're both sound money and the enemy is the Fed. Okay, well, like, let's think about that for a second. I'm going to basically give the gold bugs 90% of the money. They're going to, they're going to be worth 10 trillion. I'm worth 1 trillion. And we're both going to collectively agree that we want to topple 100 million businesses, all the accounting systems in every nation state in the world together. Like, why would I even bother, right? <laughs> why, why not simply just destroy gold? Why not just take the 10 trillion of gold and go from 1 trillion to 10 trillion? And how about, you know, try walking into the boardroom of Disney Corp or Coca-Cola and telling them that we've decided that we stand for toppling nation states and the currency and what we want them to do is buy Bitcoin. Like, I, I've said this before, you, you literally could line up everybody and every corporation in the world, hold a gun to their head and say, you have to stop taking dollars and switch your accounting systems. And you have to shoot them all. Because e even if they wanted to, they couldn't, right? Nobody can change the fact that the world runs on dollars and the accounting systems are wired for currency. So we're picking a Pyrrhic battle. Like we're going to, we're going to war over nothing because if, if you just understand Bitcoin as property and you accept the fact that, okay, well, what's the negative? The negative is, if I transfer it and I sell it, I have to pay tax on it. That's the negative. What's the positive? You're not supposed to sell it. <laughs> like the positive, like the, the worst thing you could possibly do, in my opinion, is encourage people to give up their Bitcoin. So it's, it's not a problem that you have to pay a tax if you just never pay it. The current tax code implies that you should buy it and hold it forever. And the current tax code of currency implies you should get rid of it as soon as you can, because there's no cost to get rid of it. So if we simply looked at the world like that, then we would stop wasting so much energy, right? If you've looked at every single banker, every time they mention, they say, well, is Bitcoin, a, is it a currency? Well, I mean, their answer is no, it's not a currency. Jerome Powell can't admit it's a currency. Christina Lagarde saying it's not a currency. And then the Bitcoin community oftentimes recoils in horror, like, yes, we are. Yes, we are. Why do you want to be? Like, why can't you actually be property worth $10 million a coin and not be a currency? If I told you, you could, you could basically go from zero to $10 million a coin and everybody will help you along the way. Every company, every government will help you along the way to become worth $10 million a coin. Or... You can fight with everybody, right, uh, the entire way. And if you succeed, you'll have toppled every government and every political group and every company and destroyed the entire 20th century economy, but you'll have your currency. Like, what, what's left, right? <laughs> like, if, if I rip every single company to zero and I destroy every country and every political system, you'll have your currency, but what are you going to buy with it when every company is non-existent and every government doesn't exist, right? You, you can't even buy bullets to defend yourself in the, you know, in the post-apocalyptic anarchy that follows because bullets get manufactured by companies that use accounting systems that run on dollars, right? So, so I, I guess my point really is it's not a battle of fight. Like ultimately, I, there's a, there's a view. The view is, well, you know, the politicians have too much power and they use the currency, right, uh, to, to abuse that power. Yeah, yeah right. <laughs> and the solution is 
you basically demonetize everything in the world that's that's in the physical realm and you demonetize all the currency derivatives and you just do it gradually in such a way that every company and every government that's smart enough to buy into it benefits from it and then one day you wake up and instead of instead of 60 percent or 70 percent of the wealth in the world being a currency derivative it's 10 percent and you know when 10 percent of the wealth in the world is a currency derivative and the rest is like digital property then inflation won't be so much a problem anymore right fight very shortly right uh inflation is not going to be a like people in venezuela don't have to worry about the government forcing them to hold the bolivar and inflating it because the bolivar has already lost so much of its energy that at this point when the government can no longer print the money and inflate it right what you really have to worry about is the government just seizing your property at the barrel of a gun right they're just going to expropriate it right there right the any government that prints too much currency eventually loses their currency privileges their currency collapses and so I, what you've got is this rippling succession of currency collapses. And eventually what happens is you get down to like three or four currencies and every single year, the currency is 10% less of the economy than it was before. And at some point, you know, the, at some point there'll be, we'll be down to the CNY and the USD, maybe like, maybe there's like four currencies left. And instead of, uh, instead of, how much money is denominated in USD right now? You've got, you've got all the USD, you've got every other currency pegged to the USD, you've got $100 trillion of sovereign bonds or whatever. Then you've got $50 trillion worth of currency derivatives that are equities. Then you've got all of the commercial real estate, which has got rents that are capped at CPI, so they're currency derivatives. So if I stacked everything up, what, what I have like 300, 400 trillion dollars worth of currency derivatives all pegged to the dollar about. And if Bitcoin grows to be 100 trillion to 200 trillion, then you would have 100 trillion in currency derivatives pegged to the dollar. And now the ratio shift, right? And as the ratio shift, then inflation gets to be less of an issue because the currency collapses like like who, when do politicians realize their currency, what, they can't inflate the currency? I, I think that in Turkey and in Argentina and in Venezuela, they're figuring it out right now, right? Like You'll be astonished. In Lebanon, nobody has any idea that inflation is a problem. It's truly shocking. Like nobody thinks the money printing is a problem. People see that all the money in their hands has been printed in the last two years. The, the, the money supply has gone up about eightfold in the last two years, eightfold increase. So about 700% increase in the last two years. And you will almost never hear anybody mention inflation as being part of the problem. It's astonishing. But yeah, you're right. Eventually, they're going to figure it out. It's just uh, when their currency collapses, right? When your currency, like, for example, what would be the market to issue Argentine sovereign debt right now in New York City? Right? Not, not yeah, high, not right? Very big, no. not, not very high. So at that point, you have to switch to taxation or rationalization, right? You have to start to rationalize your expenditures down. Yeah. And physical right. printing, physical printing is what they're doing. It becomes taxation or you go to rationalization or you go to expropriation and confiscation. <laughs> We're going to get there. And, and uh, when that happens, the result is a function of lots of things that are above my pay grade. But um, if, I, if I was sitting in any country right now and I wanted to do the best thing for the world, I wouldn't say, you know, buy Bitcoin so that we can defeat your central bank. I would say buy Bitcoin because it's better than buying a building. Right? I mean, it, it, if I was sitting in Turkey and I was giving a presentation and Erdogan was listening, my message would be, you know, you can invest in a building or a company, but Bitcoin is probably a better investment. It's even better investment than gold because Bitcoin is pure digital energy. It'll be good for Turkey. It'll be good for you. It'll be good for the Turkish lira. Don't you want everybody in Turkey to get rich? I mean, to, yeah. Like, like Bitcoin is, a, is an export. Digital energy is an export industry. Whereas uh, investing in a building or a piece of land in Istanbul is a domestic industry. So I think that 
it doesn't matter who you are, everybody pretty much gets the idea that we're better off if we have uh, 21st century clean export industries that are generating huge, you know, huge cash flows or huge uh, benefits to the domestic economy. So I, I, I would say pair it as uh, it is property by law. And the only way, it, you know, it's a, it's a legal definition that's defined by the communist central party, by the federal, by the IRS, by the EU central, you know, or by the EU in Brussels. You can either embrace that and say it's property. Okay, it's better property. Let's go ahead and replace the other $500 trillion of property with a better property. Why don't we grow 500 to one? And somewhere around 200 or 300 to one, we can come back to our political debate about whether we like the idea that governments can have a currency. Like, if you don't like the idea that the government gets to designate the currency while well, you can run for office and you can, you know, you can try to change that, right? But at this point in time, the likelihood yeah. that you're going to get the EU or the Chinese, you know, party or the United States to abandon their currencies is next to nothing. And all you're going to do is you're going to uh, divert 99% of your energy from something constructive. And the constructive thing is to, is to stop people from making mistakes of buying a second rental property as an investment or buying gold. Like or a checking mistake. account. Or keeping, yeah, a checking account, right? Or a saving account, which is the same thing these days, yeah. You don't need to be the enemy of the people or the enemy of the government to to promote digital property yeah, as I a better I must, idea. I must say you've kind of won me over a lot on this regard. Um, you may not be able to tell from my Twitter and my public pronouncements, but I, can, I, I, I sympathize with the idea that, uh, you know, we'll cross that bridge when we get to it. It's still a very long way away. And um, at this point, I think the, the, the comparative advantage of Bitcoin is just that it is a much better um, form of property and a much better store of value. And the political implications will come later. And I think, you know, the, the engineering side of me sometimes begins to think we're better off just focusing on this engineering aspect of it rather than just, um, you know, um, thinking about the political implications because a, you know, the political implications are just going to get people in trouble, which, you know, we don't want, especially when you, you know, if you're holding, if you're holding the Royal flush in your hands and you know that, um, this is going to, um, this is going to win eventually. Whatever happens, it is just going to win out against all the other kind of combinations of cards that you could come up with. Then you don't need to be going around telling everybody that you're going to be winning. In fact, generally, it's 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 it's, it's a very bad tactic uh, to celebrate victory before it happens. And I can see the point. That yes, I think you're absolutely correct on the demonetization of gold. It's something that I think is, uh, it doesn't really appeal much to me um, being a hard money person, Austrian economics, but I think it's, it's reality at this point. And I think um, clinging on to gold was probably the biggest financial mistake that I've ever made. I, I, even after I heard about Bitcoin for many years, I still considered, no, 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 it, you know, it's still tiny, gold is the big deal. Gold is the real thing. There have been pretenders against gold before, but I think this is it. It's over. I think it's uh, it, it, Bitcoin is only about a tenth of gold at this point, and that's just within throwing distance by Bitcoin standards. So it's uh, it, it's clear that gold is being demonetized. It's not rising as everything is rising. You know, you keep pointing out that lumber and uh, copper and nickel have been rising more than gold. And so that's an enormous $10 trillion market of people who still save money in gold and still buy gold. And I think it's at this point, it's uh, you may as well be holding fiat currency. In fact, you are in a sense holding fiat currency because central banks hold about a sixth of all the world's gold. So you're just basically pumping central bank bags when you're buying gold. That's the reality of it. They control the market for gold. They control the market for settlement and clearance of gold. They won't let there be uh, free markets in gold so that you could have a bank built around gold. Moving gold around is still enormously expensive. It can't compete with fiat or Bitcoin in terms of moving it around. And in a global economy, that's a death sentence. And I think in the last century, um, you know, you could have resisted that death sentence because you didn't have an alternative to gold. But now we do. We have Bitcoin. 
Um, and I think I also agree with you on the fact that the, the US dollar is going to basically eat all the other fiat currencies. Um, it's it, it's very obvious that all over the world people would rather hold dollars. And I think it's just a matter of, uh, you know, the, the same analysis that I use in the Bitcoin standard about the hard money driving out the easy money definitely applies for the dollar and all the other currencies. The US has an enormously larger margin for inflation um without than all the other currencies because the currency is just so much bigger and so you know the the turkish lira the, erdogan needs a whole lot of inflation in order to squeeze out a tiny little bit of extra money whereas the uh, u.s government needs a very tiny little bit of inflation to finance itself and its military so i i, I think I, I i agree with that but i'm wondering like how do you see how, how do you see this playing out do you really think that the central banks are going to just um legalize and um, allow their banks to hold on to digital currencies. And how does that fit in? You know, you said JP Morgan is going to issue a $1 trillion of uh, stable coin, but will, won't it just be a central bank digital currency? Why do you even need JP Morgan? Because, you know, you look at the Chinese model with a digital yuan and you can see, you know, with the universal basic income stuff coming along, why do we even need JP Morgan? Why doesn't the cent why doesn't the Fed just uh, add an app to the play to the Google uh, and Apple store and everybody can get a dollar? Well, I mean first of all, the government couldn't do it if they wanted to. If you, if you go back and parse Jerome Powell's comments on the subject, uh Six months to 12 months ago, he was pretty much saying that in about four years, we'll study it. And maybe in eight years, we'll do something. And then I think uh, Christina Lagarde at the same time said, well, we've decided we're going to start studying it. And the Chinese were testing it. So in, in terms of the spectrum, the Chinese were, were sort of aggressively testing it. The Europeans were thinking about studying it. And the Americans weren't even thinking about thinking about studying it yet to paraphrase um there's no political consensus there's no political will in this country for the for the um central bank to actually issue currency um you can see that in the utterances of senators and congressmen for the past three months they're they recall in horror at that idea you can also see it with the with the withdrawal of the name of um of the candidate for the occ do you see like she just withdrew her, not, her, her candidacy because she had articulated support for such a notion as you just described, <laughs> and nobody wanted to see that. So keep in mind that, uh, you know, you think the banks, you think JP Morgan, Bank of America, Citigroup, or the like, you think they would like to see it? So sometimes, sometimes I think we just, we're too, what is the word, uh, imaginative in our conspiracy theories. <laughs> You can't simultaneously have a, a strong banking lobby that's your enemy and then also imagine the government overcoming the same strong banking lobby to also be your enemy, right? Uh, so if you see the world in that adversarial way, you, you think the worst, but, but um, a different view is this, which is it's not bad for the United States dollar to spread around the world. It is not bad if the banks start issuing the dollar. And if people could move the dollar faster on some kind of high speed crypto rail, then maybe that'd be good for Bitcoin, right? Everybody advances together. So what do I think will happen? Yeah, I mean, I think that, um, that uh, you're going to see big banks. You're going to see, uh, it, it's not clear to me whether JP Morgan or Goldman Sachs will jump on this as aggressively as Silvergate Bank. It's not clear, but it is clear that someone's going to get on this very aggressively. It'll either be like an Avanti, you know, moving forward, or it'll be a Silvergate bank who have already said they're doing it. I mean, they've been very explicit about it, or it'll be a, a JP Morgan or a Bank of America that'll do it. Um, government, you know, again, governments have to be very adept at doing things and and oftentimes they're not so so uh I, I don't expect any of these governments to do it effectively even in china i don't think the chinese government is nearly as effective as their private sector i mean we saw that with the alipay alibaba wechat type issues they they still have companies and there is still tension 
between the companies, the regulators, and the central party, right? I mean, there's a, there's a federal a federal level of the Chinese government, then there's a provincial level. It was pro provincial politicians supporting Bitcoin mining in China. And then there's regulators and then there's companies. So it's just hard. And, uh, and ultimately you have to have the technical wherewithal to do it. But I, I guess even then it, it doesn't really so much matter what any other regulator thinks, right? The single most important entity here is the United States and the administration, right? Because if the dollar is the world's reserve currency, then the digital dollar, right, as defined by uh, the administration and the regulators, treasury, et cetera, are going to set the standard for how digital dollars move. And um, I think it's pretty clear what they want. What they want is either you're an FDIC approved bank or some public regulated entity that meets the same standards. If you read um, the SEC denial letter on the spot ETF, what they say over and over again is they're troubled by the fact that Bitcoin trades on crypto exchanges uh, that do not meet uh, the standards and abide by the principles of national securities exchanges. And those principles include ideas like don't lie, cheat, and steal from the customer, right? <laughs> right? Uh, so if you look at the principles there, they're basically saying, we want transparency and a set of principles, and we want them to be abided by in the crypto exchanges. And with the stable coins, they're saying, you know, we want to be able to trust that just like a bank. And uh, we don't want, so I mean, the real, you know, the nightmare scenario would be some entrepreneur offshore has 10 billion in capital. What if I put, you know, 10 billion of an altcoin backed by, you know, I, I could have a hundred million dollars in capital. I could spin up yo-yo coin and have 10 billion of yo-yo coin. I could mint an NFT on it and I could trade it to myself three times from a hundred thousand to a million to 10 million. I could print it all in, all with basically wash trades. I could lever it up 20 to one have 25, 30, 40 billion of yo-yo coin, and then I could use it to back a stable coin, and the stable coin becomes 200 billion or 500 billion worth of US dollars. That's the nightmare scenario, right? Where you've got like nothing at the bottom. You've got a crypto punk that circulated six times in blind wash sales that was levered up to an altcoin that was levered up to a stable coin that was released. And now that stuff gets into consumers wallets and it gets used for commerce and it becomes a systemic risk. So I, you know, you can't blame the regulators in that way when they say uh, we don't like the idea that there's blind wash trades with no surveillance agreements. And we don't like the idea that, the stablecoin issuers don't meet our standards as banks. And, uh, you know, the crypto community will say, oh, yeah, well, that's like, you know, that's the regulators attacking Bitcoin. There's nothing to do with Bitcoin. Right? <laughs> like I saw today, uh, you know, some crypto punk thing traded for $10 million. Okay. But, you know, like if I sold it to myself six times and I started by buying it for a nickel, you know, how much is it worth? Who could say, right? And there's no, there's no way to even figure out whether the person that owned the thing sold it to themselves. Like it used to be, my concern in an auction would be, you've got your best friend bidding on it. But, but we're much worse than that. We're at a point right now in cyberspace where you could spin up a hundred versions of yourself and you could be bidding against yourself, selling to yourself, buying from yourself. What's it worth? You know, it's like, what do you want it to be worth? How do you know? It's opaque, right? So I think, um, I think that, uh, you know, these opaque markets are, are a challenge. And uh, for the industry to grow up, you know, you've got to go to the point where there's more transparency. Securities have transparency. Banks have transparency. Regulators have transparency. You know, I, I, 
I think ultimately all this stuff has a huge impact on high velocity digital assets, right? Like NFTs and stuff like this, high velocity. It, Bitcoin, if you're holding it as digital property, properly understood is low velocity. The whole idea of Bitcoin is I just buy it and I hold it like I own a building for 27 years. And if you're holding low velocity money for 27 years, right, then is that a threat to anybody? Not really. I mean, you, you kind of get to the, maybe at the end of the day, you'll get to a point where someone will be concerned about that capital moving out of a capital control environment. But it's like so far down the list of regulatory priorities compared to all these other things like rigged auctions, uh, you know, and hyper lever levered, you know, self dealing that um, I think that uh, it's almost like not even worth being on the radar right now. Yeah, I think a lot of Bitcoiners worry too much about some of the noises from the regulators, but I think it, it, it is far more concerning for uh, these other um, 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 projects and uh, shady dealings. Um, moving on a little bit to the sailor strategy. What do you think of the sailor strategy? Well, first of all, what do you think about the El Salvador situation in general? And also, what do you think about the volcano bond that they're issuing? It is kind of the application of the sailor strategy to uh, the sovereign level. Does that kind of uh, make you revise your uh, analysis of the dollar and uh, Bitcoin? Because, I mean, they are essentially doing the same thing. They're issuing a billion dollars um, of um, bonds, and then they're using half of that, at least, to buy Bitcoin. Um, you know, I, my view would be you should issue a billion dollars of bonds and buy a billion of Bitcoin. <laughs> <laughs> the sailor, my strategy is very simple and orthodox, which is buy Bitcoin with cash. Yeah, they're, they're doing half a billion on infrastructure and stuff, which, you know, is... That just makes not... it sovereign debt. So yeah. It's sovereign debt. Yeah. It's, so I don't, I don't it's have an opinion sovereign debt. safe. Like the truth of the matter, I don't have an opinion on that. And I, 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 I wouldn't endorse everything done by everyone that happens to have Bitcoin attached to it. Right. It's like, it's like, uh, you're asking me about the business plan of a Bitcoin miner. Well, would I buy the Bitcoin mining stock? Some yes, some no, but you're now you've moved into the, you've moved into the realm of securities, right? If you pick, yeah. you know, do I endorse PayPal versus square versus Coinbase, you know, versus FTX? That's a, that's a securities issue. Do I endorse a, a miner? That's a securities issue. Do I endorse any any country doing anything they want? No, but what do I endorse? I think they should buy Bitcoin, right? I mean, here's what I think makes sense. You should buy Bitcoin with, uh, with assets. Um, I think that makes sense. I think that it makes sense to deploy 24-7, 365 light speed systems to move assets around. But even the dollar, right? So, for example, I think it makes sense to have a digital wallet that has dollars on it and has Bitcoin in it, and it moves on the Lightning Network at the speed of light. But you know what? I, I would I would endorse you moving on the WhatsApp network too, like or the Apple Pay network. Or the, if Google, Apple, Amazon, Facebook, if they all agreed to just move Bitcoin and digital dollars on their own networks, I'm very I'm open to that now. Is that better than lightning? Like now you're back into a, it's a proprietary competitive issue, right? What's better, lightning or Apple Pay? Well, I mean, what's better, YouTube or Twitter? What's better? I mean, these are all, yeah. they're all, what? if I had a choice of Bitcoin versus the other thing, I always choose Bitcoin. That's better. Yeah. Because Bitcoin, but here's the distinction it's an ethical distinction. Bitcoin is property. Property is property is ethically superior to a security. Like for example, if you ask me, should I own Bitcoin or MicroStrategy stock? Well, the answer is Bitcoin is a property. MicroStrategy stock is a security. When you when you're buying the security, you're taking you're taking management team risk, competitive risk, execution risk. 
You're, you've got nexus in a nation state. MicroStrategy is a U.S. regulated company. Twitter has got a headquarter. So does Apple, right? So, so look, when you go to El Salvador, well, El Salvador is a nation state, right? So, so should I live with my Bitcoin in El Salvador or live with my Bitcoin in Florida or live with my Bitcoin in Lebanon or live with my Bitcoin? In, well, I mean, very complicated question, right? I mean, yeah, no, and, but I mean, I guess I don't. I, I don't really think there's one answer. I think you got to respect everybody's choice when it comes to these things, if they have to make a choice, right? I, I guess I would applaud the idea that you're buying Bitcoin. Anything that's buying Bitcoin, I applaud. But, uh, you know, I'd rather actually see you say, I took a billion dollars worth of cash and I bought Bitcoin and then I'd rather see you say, I borrowed a billion and I bought Bitcoin, right? I, I think the purest approach, right, is, is the best approach. I mean, when you're, when you're asking me would I endorse a bond that's going to invest in blank? Well, if the blank is something other than Bitcoin, then you've just enticed me to make a securities statement, right? I, I'm taking, like, should you or should you not do that? Well, I'm not, I'm not asking you if you should that's a risk buy it thing, or not. Right? I think I'm, I was asking it in terms of, you know, the previous question where we were discussing the evolution of the dollar and Bitcoin. I guess the question here is this, if, um, if El Salvador, and this is not entirely out of the question, if they go and announce that, uh, you know, if they produce a new currency, if they revive their old colon, but this time it's 100% redeemable for Bitcoin. Basically, they just rename the, you know, they, all they need to do basically is just change the denomination on their Chivo app from being Satoshi to being colon. You know, they could make it so that one Satoshi is one colon. And then anybody in the world can download that app and send Bitcoin to it. And then that complicates things because now um, the colon is a foreign currency. And that uh, changes the treatment of it in uh, in U.S. law. If I'm not mistaken, then you can use that as a currency because it is a foreign currency. So it's like you're buying and selling euros. And then that probably, um, you know, legally and, and taxation wise, does that change the analysis that you've offered? What do you think? I think it's a it's above my pay grade. Say. <laughs> Like getting into the creation of a new, you know, national currency is a bit above my pay grade. I, I, I have a different point of view. I, I think that all the currencies are going to go away except for the dollar and the RMB. Like you want to, when, when everything is reduced to the end game here, it seems to me like you've got the dollar, you've got currencies in the Western world pegged to the dollar. And by the way, the Chinese currency is pegged to the dollar right now. Okay. Yeah. So uh, if I look at it, I, I wouldn't, I'm not sure how much effort I would spend on creating another one. I mean, I think that ultimately you've got, the, everybody's going to dollarize. And if they're not going to dollarize, maybe, uh, maybe the Chinese can stand against the US dollar. I mean, they're making a good run at it. But the only way that they're actually pegging to the dollar is through capital controls. If their capital controls fail, this, the CNY is going to collapse against the dollar. Okay, so, so uh, it seems to me that if you look forward a decade, you got 8 billion people that have uh, a couple of digital currencies in their wallet. They have the local currency they hold for a couple of days. They have the worldwide currency they hold for a couple of months and they have some assets and, uh, and Bitcoin is the king asset, but there are other assets. Like I'm not, I'm not saying other crypto assets, but for example, maybe you want to own a share of stock in Apple. If they ever tokenize Apple stock, then maybe that'll be an asset you would hold in your wallet. Now, 80% of the world can't buy securities. I mean, they, they can buy crypto, but they can't buy securities because securities aren't tokenized. They don't trade 24 seven, 365. So, you know, it, it, let me ask you this question, right? What do you think the world needs more like Apple and Google token or uh, Dogecoin, son of Dogecoin for the puppy coin token, right? 
like what if we go forward right puppy coin the world could do without but probably google and apple the world still wants so i actually think the only reason you have so many crypto assets is because they trade 24 7 365 and they're egalitarian and everybody can hold them and people can't buy facebook token or apple token or google token in africa on a saturday afternoon friction free so it's possible when the dust settles that uh, the sec will actually create a path for securities to roll off of nasdaq and new york stock exchange and, and trade 365 days a year 24 7. and if that happens then you'll have assets you'll have some property and maybe you'll have a gold token if you're silly i don't know i mean a bitcoin token a something token and you'll have some security assets and that's your portfolio of uh investments that's your treasury portfolio and then you'll have your wallet your your checking account and that'll be dollars and pesos or dollars and euros or something like that or dollars and cny and it, you can see why i mean we, we, we're not going to make Apple computer go away in the next five years. We need Apple computer. We're not going to make the Chinese government go away. We need the Chinese government. Some stuff will go away. Weak companies will go away. Weak tokens will go away. Weak currencies, you know, will just collapse. But, but you know, wherever the currency collapses, that means the government collapse, right? I mean, didn't you just tell me that people still like the lira in Lebanon? So when the government completely collapses, then the, the, the Lebanese currency will also be gone. Until that point, what you have, what you really got is just a question of ratios. Like what portion of your money is in each of those things, right? And if 57% of your money is in Bitcoin and 22% of your money is in equity tokens, and then 10% uh, of your money is in the dollar and 2% or 1% of your money is in the local currency, then that seems rational. And uh, you just move that speed of light. So I, I guess what I would say constructively is we, we would be better to spend our bandwidth focusing upon the macroeconomic situation, which is in 10 years, Bitcoin's up 161% a year for the last 10 years. Gold is up 1% for every year for the 10 years. The S&P is up 14%. Long bonds are up 2.3%. Okay, so the real issue is how do you let 8 billion people pick their mix of those macro assets? And, you know, we can see what's happened in the past 12 months, right? Gold's down 3%, Bitcoin's up 163%, S&P's up 27%, bonds are down 6%. Okay, so what you really want to do is you just want Bitcoin to continue to demonetize monetary assets real estate's monetized equities are monetized why are they monetized safe well one reason they're monetized is because you can't buy real estate and you can't buy equities on binance like binance does a really good job of trading stuff right like, like the crypto world here's what we should like about the the crypto world they really push really hard this idea of Let's be. Let's upload any token and let you trade it twenty four seven three sixty five. Like I mean, F FTX maybe is between FTX and Binance. They kind of put all the traditional exchanges to shame, right? You want to monetize, or if you want to liquidate your property, it's uh, six to twelve months and six percent fee, and mountains of paperwork. So. It's really hard to, to, to liquidate it once I'm into it, and it's hard to buy it. How do you buy a piece of uh, Las Vegas real estate if you live in uh, South Africa? Can't, right? So I feel like the discretionary money is finding its way into crypto tokens, but it's quite possible if we tokenize all the other assets in the world, that then there's a different balance, right? I mean, there's, there's too much money in currency derivatives and there's not enough money in other things. But if, you know, if we demonetize some of the other things, like 
If you're international, you're more likely to buy Apple stock if it's tokenized in a crypto exchange, but you're less likely to buy Apple stock if you live in America once you trust Bitcoin, right? So we have this war of capital and a flow of capital and capital is going to flow from traditional assets to digital assets in one system while, uh, while capital uh, flows from crypto assets back into traditional assets in another system. If, if every, all 8 billion people in the world had equal access to everything, right? Which they don't. But I think the short of it is when you get into this issue of currency wars, you've moved into debates between nation states. And I, I just don't think it's a good use of time. I think it's much more constructive for us to focus upon, upon um, getting people to reallocate energy from the 99% of the assets which are not currently Bitcoin and not currently digital. And if they just sweep them all to digital, right, then, then you'll get to see a rationalization of investment portfolios. Yeah, I think ultimately what is driving all of this, you know, the reason people have to be trading all of this stuff is, as you call it, money is like an ice cube. I think if the US dollar was inflating every year and the supply was increasing every year at only 1%, I think that would just um, kill all of these uh, markets. You know, if it was if the supply was increasing on one percent, the value of the U.S. dollars in real term would be probably going up by two, three, four percent, depending on obviously what good you're looking at. But I think for most people, holding on to dollars at that point becomes a very good option. It's no longer a melting ice cube. So, of course, that's a very, very big if. We're not going to move to that kind of world. But I think the um, I, I agree with you, and I don't want to be too much of a devil's advocate here, and I don't want to be putting you on the spot, but I think um, I, I think there's a bit of an unstable equilibrium. As long as the dollar is inflationary, we're going to have all of that money moving around, um, looking for a home. And the only way this <laughs> resolves is when it finds its home in the best asset. And the tricky part here is that there's no stopping this strain. You know, you said if it doubles every year for the next 10 years, if it doubles every year for the next 10 years, it's going to be at around a thousand trillions, which is a quadrillion dollar, which is currently in, in, in today's dollars, it's double the size of all the assets that are in the world. Um, even if it goes up at 150%, it'll be at around a thousand trillion or a quadrillion in about 18 years. So, you know, by that time, I think there's no escaping the political implications of the fact that you've basically eaten up the bond market. And really, the, 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 uh, I think the, the main course here and the grand prize is not so much the dollar as, a, as much as it is the bond market, because the bond market is what allows the dollar to be inflationary. It's what allows governments to continue to borrow. So I guess, I guess my point here is, is, why would you want to extrapolate out 20 years, imagine a revolution in the world, and then invite someone to assume you're correct and therefore shut you down now? Wouldn't it be smarter if you simply focused upon demonetizing gold? Because you might True. be wrong. I mean, isn't it? I mean, there's a certain arrogant presumption to, to assume that you know what the world will look like in 15 years. There's a different world, which is what if everything just becomes digitally transformed and Bitcoin grows as digital property and we have uh, digital assets in the form of equity tokens and Apple stock spreads around the world and then capital flees from this currency to that currency and may, you know, everybody thinks the dollar is going to weaken, but the dollar is going to strengthen before the dollar weakens. And uh, what if, what if what happens is everything gets digitally transformed and capital moves faster and the world gets rational. And in the, you know, and if, you know, if, if, uh, if capital flows out of sovereign debt, it'll flow out of third, uh, you know, other nation sovereign debt first, which will strengthen the dollar which may, which may actually have the counter effect. So capital is going to flow out of all these things. If capital does flow, 
let's say capital flows out of bonds and the bond market collapses. Well, the yields are going to triple. And then there are a lot of people that are holding uh, capital in value stocks are going to sell their value stocks and they're going to migrate into the bonds again. Right. And so you're going to have you're going to have all sorts of trading for the next decade to two decades. And it's very difficult to know what will happen. But, you know, there there's there is a pessimistic view, which is, well, I'm sure it's going to pretty much collapse the world and we're either going to get away with it or please stop us. Or, or there's another optimistic view, which is the world's going to get more rational. And as the world gets more rational, capital is going to be allocated more rationally and political systems are going to be rationalized. And as the world gets more rational, things will get better. And at some point, we will, you know, if you believe in the political process, at some point, people will spend less money or they will rationalize the tax in some way and there'll be some peaceful resolution to the thing. So, so be yeah. it. Big like, we still do need, we still need companies, right? You still need companies. So at some point, Apple stock's going to be worth something. Even if, if it goes to a dollar, there'll be someone that'll think it's a good investment, right? So you need companies. You, you know, you still need countries. Like maybe they'll reorient, right? Maybe Canada will break into French speaking and English speaking or not, right? But you still have political systems. Um, are bonds destined forever? You know, I mean, there's still a place for bonds. It's just different bonds at different rate, right? If bond, if bond yields go up, then capital will flow back into them. It's the, the, the argument that I make in the fiat standard is that what's driving the bond market is not the credit worthiness, worthiness of the borrower, but rather the, um, the demand for a store of value. You know, the reason people are buying Greek bonds and uh, Brazilian bonds and up until very recently Lebanese bonds is because where else are they going to put their money? They don't, st they still don't know about Bitcoin. And they just think that there aren't a, any good ways where you don't get equity risk. But now, you know, with the discovery of Bitcoin, it becomes much, um, it becomes a much more compelling place than, you know, lending to all these governments. So yields will go up, but then governments won't be able to service those yields. And so I think we likely witness the bond market shrink. And yeah, I, mean, I, I think there is, there's also kind of middle ground between my view and yours here, and, and which is that governments will just learn uh, discipline. They'll be able to buy Bitcoin. They'll be able to save their, uh, you know, save themselves by buying Bitcoin and they'll continue to be able to operate, but they won't, but they'll operate responsibly and they'll have to shift towards, uh, you know, they'll get a big boost from their Bitcoin holdings going up, but it won't be, um, a system where they can continuously run eternal deficits. They'll get a boost that'll allow them to phase out their irresponsibility, um, hopefully, you know, relatively uh, bloodlessly and uh, smoothly. But then, you know, the, the, the big kind of high time preference party of the 20th century has to come to some kind of end. And the governments that manage to transition to some form of responsibility will obviously do much better than the ones that don't. Yeah. Yeah, I agree. Okay, great. I mean, could, uh, couldn't you say that at the end of the day, there'll be three classifications of political reaction? Uh, there'll be some governments that, that uh, resist reality and they collapse. And, and maybe they collapse into civil war or they just collapse into chaos. And there'll be some governments that, that fight, resist, struggle, and eventually uh, reconfigure themselves after great deals of pain and agony. And there'll be some governments that, that look at the world and they they uh, transform themselves in an agile fashion, and they maybe they don't get through without without stress, but they morph into something different and accommodate the world. Right? What happens if a small country? Right, uh, the best example would be what if a small country that still has a currency starts printing the currency to buy Bitcoin? The first one, right? There's a little bit of room, right? Like uh, like what if UAE? right? Or, or Saudi Arabia, what if they were to go and just start buying Bitcoin with their currency? Like how long could, I mean, in theory, couldn't you, if you ran a country like uh, Emirates, couldn't you go ahead and buy billions, two, three, five, 10 billion of this before anybody noticed before it, and, and it might never weaken your currency, right? 
Yeah, they've got an enormous Might strengthen amount of excess your currency, capital. Right? Yeah, they're hosting World Cups that, you know, cost them a lot of money. They could be buying Bitcoin like, and watching maybe, the World Cup on TV. Like a good, uh, I mean, a good model to consider is <clears throat> Norway and Sweden and other sovereign wealth funds, right? The, the really, they're, you know, you've got regressive, you've got Cuba and Venezuela, right? And North Korea, and they're not really good at embracing property rights. And then you've got the middle of the road conventional, and their central banks are holding, you know, U.S. sovereign debt or gold, but mainly just sovereign debt. And then you've got progressive nations. And Norway is one. Norway's got a massive equity portfolio, right? Switzerland's got a massive. They, they didn't use gold. They actually used big tech as a store of value. Um, you know, K KSA and UAE. In fact, all of the Middle Eastern countries, they generally have sovereign wealth funds that are holding diversified portfolios of property, including equity. They own banks, they own big tech. Sometimes, sometimes they own like tons of, of property, real estate, REITs, not to mention commodities, right? Oil rights, like mineral rights and the like. So I think, uh, I think generally, the world is a more complicated place than we are able to predict, right? Like you're trying to predict what the market will do. And is, is it the whole basis of Austrian economics, right? That nobody can really predict the market, you know? No. Yeah, it's human action at the end of the day. And nobody so everybody has free will, right? Like MicroStrategy can do what it did. Like MicroStrategy stock was 120. And then we flipped and it's up by a factor of five. And, and what did we do? We basically bought some Bitcoin and then we started issuing stock to buy Bitcoin. Isn't that the same as a country buys some Bitcoin and starts issuing currency to buy Bitcoin? Yeah. Right? Yeah. So I guess it's, a, it's slightly different because it devalues the currency when you issue more of it. But if you back no, it, it with Bitcoin. It, 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 it isn't slightly different because when you issue stock, you devalue the stock, right? You, if you're issuing equity, you're diluting the equity. And if you issue yeah, but, currency, you're diluting the currency, but- But the equity is a claim on the, uh, uh, on the cash flows of the company. The and the currency, currency is a claim on the assets of the bank that issued the currency. If it is redeemable in, uh, if, if it's redeemable in gold or Bitcoin, then yeah. So that's what they've got to do. They have to go on a Bitcoin standard. Well, let's, let's be extreme, right? What happens if UAE buys $10 billion of Bitcoin and the price of Bitcoin then increases by a factor of 20. And next thing you know, they've, they've got $200 billion worth of Bitcoin and everybody in the world knows they've got $200 billion worth of Bitcoin. Well, the first thing that's going to happen is worth... the Saudis are going to want to buy more then. <laughs> Yeah, so I think uh, I think the point here really is, yeah, you can spend a lot of time fantasizing about how you never want any banks to buy Bitcoin, and you never want any companies to buy Bitcoin, and you never want any governments to buy Bitcoin. And since they're not going to ever buy any Bitcoin, you're the enemy of the banks and the companies and the government, right? Yeah. Or, right, and and you see that narrative, right? Like. Right, banks are the enemy of Bitcoin, companies are the enemy of Bitcoin, not your keys, not your coin, the government's the enemy of Bitcoin. But the other possibility, which just turns the entire thing on its head is, what, how would you feel if you woke up tomorrow and you found out that Goldman Sachs did buy $10 billion of Bitcoin and UAE bought 20 billion of Bitcoin? Would you be angry? By the way, no. your Bitcoin would be trading at like $4 million of Bitcoin. And you could be angry and say, no, no, give that back to us. I want to go back to $50,000 Bitcoin. <laughs> Look, if institutions weren't involved in Bitcoin, Bitcoin would be trading at like 8,000 right now. Right? Yeah. If you look at, you know, the last 18 months. So you could like just, we could unwind that and you go back to $8,000 Bitcoin or you can move forward, but it's just a taste. So, you know, my, what's my big point here? It's... It's like uh, nobody can predict how the future will evolve, except to make this one observation. People are generally rational and they take the path of least resistance. And so at some point, 
it's possible that someone's going to buy the Bitcoin, not because they agree that with, with your most extreme vision of no governments and no companies and living together peacefully in one world currency. Maybe that's not why they're going to do it. Maybe they just want the money, right? <laughs> Yeah, for sure. Uh, and, Bitcoin is, is far more popular than anarchist ideology. That's for sure. I, I, I totally uh, so when appreciate that happens, and understand that. Right. When that happens, then uh, the entire thing is going to tilt a different direction. Inconceivable. Right. Yeah. You, don't, you just don't even know which direction it's going to go. But the world is going to find its way forward. And, and uh, you know, like... When the lockdowns took place, right, there's this phrase, life finds a way, right? You know, like the Jurassic Park phrase. When the lockdowns took place, we shut down cruise lines and we shut down airlines and we shut down theme parks and we shut down movie theaters. And if you're, if, if you're uh, an investor in the Disney Corporation, you could look at the Disney Corporation and you could say, well, they're in cruise lines. Oh, oh, and hotels, hotels, airlines, cruise lines, theaters, everything shut down. You know, and if you're if you're an analyst, you could say, well, it's pretty obvious. The stock is impaired. The company is impaired. I should just dump my stock I or I should short the stock. But at the end of the day, someone went on television and said, how's Disney going to react? And someone went and Disney went on television and said, we're just going to do Disney plus streaming. And they said, well, how many customers do you have? Like right now, you know, at the time of the lockdown, they were like the ninth largest, you know, non-launch streaming service. And it would have accounted for 0.1% of their revenue or 1% of their revenue and minus nothing of their profit. And you could just focus on that narrative or you get on TV and say, yeah, well, we think by the year 2025, we're going to actually be growing 100% year over year. And everybody said, this is great. They've got a plan. Pump Stock at an all time high. Yeah. And, and so, you know, and so the point really is are you going to bet on everybody to lose or, and not come up with the right strategy? Or what are the odds that they're just going to find a strategy, which is a winning strategy and a winning way to accommodate, right? I mean, nobody on Di nobody from Disney got on television and said, you know, the you know, streaming video will never replace the theme parks. It will never replace, you know, the the movie experience. We believe families need to come together in our hotels and be in our you know Disney World rides. I mean. They didn't spend a lot of time, you know, wallowing in self-pity and dealing with that reality. They just completely changed the focus, talk about the new thing, and move forward. So I, I think that uh, everybody loves a winner. Yeah. And Bitcoin's a winner. And the winning strategy is let everybody win with us, right? Like, yes. Definitely. Everybody can win with this. I don't care what government, you know, can governments win? Yes, all of them. Even the ones I don't like, even the ones I don't like, right? Can companies win? All of them. Can the banks win? Yeah, sure they can. I don't, you know, yeah. you don't like that company because they censor this thing. No, they could still win. Like at the end of the day, if everybody wins with you and you're, you know, you have the most extreme values, like multi-sig coal storage with, you know, guns in a cabin and your own source of water and your own food supply, you're still going to be better off, right? You're That's true. You know, your Bitcoin's still going to be worth 10 million of Bitcoin. Yeah, my, my view on all of this is to tell people that, you know, Bitcoin's permissionless and that includes that it's uh, complete, you can't stop people from selling IOUs for Bitcoin. You know, it, people think about it as if we need to stop people from buying Bitcoin IOUs. Well, no, it's Bitcoin holders who are selling IOUs and there's nothing you can do about it. And I think, you know, generally as a libertarian leaning anarchist, I, I, I don't get upset at things that are peaceful. I can't oppose people doing peaceful things that don't hurt others. So I'm definitely with you on that. 
Now, I wanted to talk a little bit more about your um, strategy for buying debt, buying Bitcoin with debt. I think, you know, your your appearance with this strategy was really the kind of um, the glue that held the fiat standard book together. It's what allowed me to finalize this book because it really made it all click to me that the way to win in Bitcoin is to stack or gold with, you know, with a hard monetary system, the way to win is to stack as many units as you can, you know, get as many sats as you can, as many gold coins as you can. And, you know, the more you get, the more secure you are, the more you can feed your family, the better off they are, the more you can guarantee their future into, um, the, it, into the future um, when you're not there and that's how you win but then with fiat it really is the other way around you want to stack a negative balance as much as you can you know and you've said this before and it blew my mind but really the point with fiat is to die with as much debt as you can you know you want to keep on rolling on debt as much as you can throughout your life and um, that and, and so acquire hard assets and take on fiat debt. You want to have fiat as your liability. And I think that just makes a lot of sense. And it's really clarified my thinking about the fiat standard in that this is this is this is really how rich people get rich under fiat. They borrow in fiat. Poor people hold on to savings in fiat and then they witness their savings depreciate and the returns that you make from holding money in the bank don't keep up with inflation. And if you're borrowing, you're benefiting from the fact that you're uh, benefiting from the inflation. So I think this is, this is, um, and you know, I, I come from a background where I used to think, you know, borrowing is bad. And I, you know, for the first few years that I'd heard about Bitcoin, I first didn't buy, and then I didn't borrow to buy. And I thought, you know, I'll just wouldn't borrow. But in retrospect, that was probably the second biggest mistake other than um, holding on to gold, is that I could have borrowed Lebanese liras. Um, and bought Bitcoin and like I've run the numbers on it and it's just absolutely um, it's an absolute no-brainer in, re in retrospect when especially when the lira has lost 95% of its value in the last couple of years and Bitcoin has gone up many many multiples so I want to ask you um, what do you think is the correct strategy to do in terms of debt because we had this discussion in the last time and it was in late February when you came here for the last time and you know you said things are going to be different from now on we're not going to get major drawdowns in bitcoin i said you said you know something like 30 40 percent probably i said we, i i can see us losing 70 80 percent since then we haven't had 70 and 80 but we did have 56 percent which is significantly large number so a lot of people who might have taken on the strategy of borrowing um, might have gotten wrecked and lost their Bitcoin. So what do you think is the correct strategy to do? So you want to borrow, but then if you're borrowing, you're leaving yourself vulnerable to price fluctuations. You could get yeah. liquidated. Okay, well, I mean, the, the first question is, is who's loaning the money to you, right? And what are the terms of the loan? So Bitcoin's up 163% on average each year for a decade. If your time horizon is four years, right? I mean, I, I think no one ever lost money holding Bitcoin four years, right? I mean, there's like a two year time period when it was pretty brutal, but otherwise yeah. you want to have a four year time horizon. <coughs> and um, look, if you, if you um, were borrowing, you could have borrowed money on your credit cards, right? I mean, like you could have borrowed money at 15% interest and you still would have made 150% yield, right? So there's almost no interest rate. I mean, nothing between zero and 15% that would have been too much in that entire time period. Now, if you look out for the next decade, what's your forecast? I mean, I, I think that expecting a 20% appreciation is not unreasonable on the next two, three, four, five years. Like, will it go faster? I mean, yeah, you would expect faster than that, but what it means is that any interest rate between zero and 15% is probably fine as long as you have intent to hold for four years or longer, because you could in theory get a drawdown in 12 months, right? That would put you underwater. So you can't have any any loan that comes due. So if you look at the loans that are safe, right, any loan you can roll forward, you know, for a reasonable amount of time is probably good. Um, 
a home loan, a, a 10 year, 15 year and 30 year mortgage against property is a no brainer. The best sources of debt are subsidized by the countries, the nation states, right? So in the United States, we subsidize debt against real estate property, especially conforming loans, but even non-conforming. We subsidize conforming loans via Freddie Mac and Fannie Mae, and you could borrow money at two and a half percent interest. It's not marked to market. So if you had any equity in property, you could pretty much borrow at two and a half percent and you could invest at 161 percent right so what's the risk of that i i don't see the risk right like is bitcoin going to go up more than three percent a year for the next decade you know if if so then it's a mistake not to maximize any kind of home equity loan right now the United States government is supporting the mortgage market, um, even in jumbo loans via buying mortgage-backed securities each month. So even on jumbo loans and the like, right? I mean, isn't, isn't the cost of debt for lots of things three, four, five percent? Um, I think that uh, any of these loans that are uh, that are south of eight percent, they seem to me like pretty good money for an asset which we can reasonably. Ex it's going up at twenty x that rate. Right. So, so if they're not marked to market against the Bitcoin, it's a non question. Right. Now, I think the real issue is what if, would you borrow against your own Bitcoin? Well, if you borrowed against Bitcoin with a loan to value 25%, you're probably safe. That, but I, I would, I try to avoid, if I was going to be marked to market, I mean, the rules in the equity market in the US are you can't normally lever up more than 50% loan to value. And there's good reason for that, right? If you, if you had a million dollars of assets and you borrow $500,000 and then you have 1.5 million in assets, if you were to get a 70%, a 66% drawdown, right? Then you're gonna get a margin call, right? So, so I think that, uh, when you lever more than two to one, you put yourself in a situation where you can get wiped out. Obviously, everybody in the crypto area in the community is leveraging between two to one and 20 to one or two to one and 101. That's why they get forced liquidated all the time <laughs> because they're doing massive leverage. I, I personally aren't, I, I wouldn't, I'm not a real big believer in, in borrowing money that gets marked to market because you get this destructive cycle right where the asset trades down and if you ever do get a margin call and you're uniformly in that you could get liquidated and then you're wiped out permanently so i don't think that's a, a very good thing but if um if i had um a million dollars of bitcoin and my choice was to sell a hundred thousand dollars of it to pay my living expenses or borrow a hundred thousand dollars against it at six percent or seven or eight percent, I would probably borrow the hundred thousand, pay the eight percent, and keep the million dollars of exposure, then sell it. Because if you sold a hundred, in order to sell it, you would have to actually sell, in some cases, up to two hundred thousand. Like if you live in California and you have a million dollars of Bitcoin, you would have eight hundred thousand dollars of Bitcoin the next day. You would pay a hundred thousand in tax to the state of California. You would have a hundred thousand to live on, and your stack would be reduced to eight hundred thousand. Right. So, if on the other hand, you were just to borrow a hundred thousand, you would have a loan to value ten percent, and uh, you would incur eight thousand dollars in interest over the course of a year, and you would have a million dollars appreciating it whatever Bitcoin appreciates at. So if, a, if Bitcoin appreciates at 20%, you'd have 1.2 million the next year, right? And then you could do it again. You could do it ad infinitum, right? At that level. So you just have to be able to stomach the volatility. The way you stomach the volatility is you keep your loan to value really low, really low. Uh, even smarter idea though is... Um, is uh, if you're a dentist, 
or you're, you're, you have some kind of business, finance your cash flows. Like, find it, like you have a business, right? If you can sell equity in the business, that's a way of financing the business. And if you sell, if you mortgage the business, that's a way of financing the business. And both of those have the benefit of not being mark to market loans. Well, let, let's take the extreme. What if I offered you a million dollar loan for a hundred years on a, on, on, against your personal signature and the interest rate was 3%, would you feel it's risky to buy Bitcoin with that? Like what's the worst that could happen? Not much. Nothing, right? You'll be dead in a hundred years. The worst that could happen is in a hundred years after you're dead, the Bitcoin is less worth less than a million dollars, right? See, so small chance. I Maybe you can come up with some way Bitcoin goes to zero the day after you take the loan and you can't pay the 3% interest, then I guess it comes due. So slight risk of owning the Bitcoin. But you see, as the, as the term of the loan extends, as the interest rate falls, and as the collateral changes, you know, debt goes from being debt to being equity. What if I just gave you the million dollars forever and no interest rate and no redemption rate? That's equity, right? Yeah. W would you take that and buy Bitcoin with it? Probably. Why, why wouldn't you? Yeah. Like, like if you're a dentist and your dental practice is going to appreciate five, it's going to grow 5% a year. You're going to grow your top line 5%, your cash flow is 5%. And someone said they want to invest in your dental practice and buy half of it and they'll give you a million dollars. Would you give them half of your upside and then take the million and invest it in Bitcoin, which you thought was going to grow at 20% a year for the next 20 years? You see, in that particular case, what you're doing is you're diversifying your portfolio from a cash rich uh, value stock right, your cash practice to now a property portfolio. So I think when you really think about financing, the question is, what kind of money can you raise and, and what strings come attached to it? And it's different for everybody, right? It depends on what country you live in. If you live in the US, you have Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac and you have, like you need a car, you can pay for the car in cash or you can borrow money at 2% interest to buy the car. Well, everything is a choice of do I own Bitcoin or not, right? If I pay for the car in cash, it's like I paid for it in Bitcoin, right? It may be worse. It may be like if I pay for the car with Bitcoin, not only did I pay for the car, but I paid for it twice because I got to pay tax on the Bitcoin if I own the Bitcoin. So yeah. the worst case would be to give up 100000 in Bitcoin to get a $50,000 car. The next worst case would be I had 50,000 in cash. I could either buy Bitcoin with it or I could buy a car with it. And the best case would be I got, I bought the car for nothing and I accepted a 3% loan against the car that I pay off over seven years and I kept the Bitcoin, you see, or I bought Bitcoin. So ask me a question. Would I rather borrow money at three per Sometimes by the way, you can borrow money at like 0% interest to buy a car. Have you noticed like, if the dealer has a subsidy, sometimes the dealer will subsidize the loan and they'll give you a no interest loan or a 1% loan to buy the car. So Mike, should I buy, should I borrow money to buy the car or should I pay for it in Bitcoin and, and not invest Bitcoin? The answer is, I think I would take the loan. I would take all the credit you would give me and I would maximize the portfolio. I think the general principle, if you step back, is um, in, a, in an inflationary environment, right? If, if the inflation rate's 15%, the monetary inflation rate is 15%, and it's at least 15% right now. If the inflation rate is 15% and the cost of capital is 5%, and you have a use of proceeds, if you've got a property that you believe will appreciate faster than 15%, let's say 30%, right? Then all day long, what you would do is you would borrow, you would take on debt and pay the 
you would invest the capital into the property yielding 30%, you would scrape the 25% arbitrage. And the only thing you would spend your time focused on is how do I negotiate the terms of the loan so I don't get forced liquidated by a capricious lender? Like I don't want, for example, um, if you could buy a house and the house was a 3% mortgage and you could either pay for it in cash or pay 3% mortgage in an inflationary environment, you would probably take the mortgage, right? Probably. Now, what if the bank had a clause in the, in the loan that said, every month we can send an appraiser to your house. And if we think that your house is worth less because it got struck by lightning or your neighbors moved in and they blare loud music or because people, because the mayor instituted lockdowns in your city, if we think it's worth less, we can mark down the price of the house by 25%. And then if it gets marked down below, you know, below the value of your loan, then we can call the loan and you owe us the principal immediately on demand. Now, would you take the loan? No. Yeah. So the problem is the terms, not the loan. <laughs> The That's reason why basically is a, borrowing on exchanges is the worst thing you could do. Because the exchange could mark down the value of your collateral while you're asleep based upon you. a manipulation and force liquidate you and take your life savings. Yeah. It's like, it's like you went to bed and Bitcoin was 49,000. And uh, during the night, it traded down to 16,000 for 13 seconds. And then the exchange force liquidated you and they took all your money and sold your Bitcoin at 23,000. And you've lost everything. And now Bitcoin is trading at 59,000 again. And how do you feel? Like you got- Yeah, it's happened. Abused, right? Yeah. Okay, so- that's the problem with mark to market, especially mark to market when you when you post your collateral in the hands of a counterparty. You know, and that, and that could even be some like Dogecoin guy manipulated the market down. Right? The, the real problem in the crypto world is it could be Yo-Yo Coin levered up a hundred to one, force liquidated, rippling into ETH, rippling into Bitcoin. In fact, I'm certain. I'm certain that volatility from all these other cryptos does ripple into Bitcoin. You can watch it, right? It's like someone hammers this thing 37% and the ripple is felt over here because Bitcoin is cross collateralized or pledged as collateral to ETH, which is pledged as collateral to Yo-Yo coin or something. And these things are all highly levered and traded all the time. So I think, you got to be really careful, like in general, about pledging collateral that could be forced liquidated. But I think that if you can actually raise debt with um, fixed collateral, right? The best thing is I mortgage a property, I mortgage a building, I mortgage a car, I mortgage a business, I borrow money on a personal non -rec recourse loan, you know, something like that. And then I use, I use that because you want long-term capital that's got a low interest rate. But even at the end of the day, the interest rate is really secondary. Like whether you pay 4% or 8%, at the end of the day, isn't really as important as whether or not the collateral is marked to market and force liquidated on volatility, right? That's really the material thing that'll destroy you, right? The likelihood yeah. that Bitcoin will trade down 50% um, for one minute sometime in the next five years is high. But the likelihood that it will trade down 50% and stay there forever is low, right? So you just got to understand that. Yeah. But, well, now, we'll be, now we'll... by the way, say, I think one more point to make, which is important is the monetary inflation rate is um is the risk of doing nothing so if the monetary inflation rate was seven percent seven percent monetary inflation every year and you were thinking about investing in something right um you would you would think well 
there's only a 7% cost to do nothing. But if the monetary inflation rate went to 21%, now the cost is 21 per, You have to believe you're going to get wiped out 21% of the time not to do something. And if the monetary inflation rate went to 60%, then you would have to believe that there's a 60% chance of losing all your money in the next 12 months to do nothing. So as the monetary inflation rate, uh, let's take Lebanon, right? In Lebanon, if, you, if the currency lost 90% of its value in 12 months, and I gave you any other option, as long as the other option doesn't liquidate you, it doesn't wipe you out with 90% probability, you would have been better off to take the other option. So I think that uh, the decision-making here, your, your thought about um, taking on leverage becomes easier as the economy hyperinflates. Let's take the extreme. I, I tell you that the local currency is going to lose 95% of its value in the next 12 months. Wouldn't you think you really just want to mortgage up just about everything because that's like 2% a week almost. So, yeah. I, yeah, I mean, certainly if you could get credit card debt or whatever, you'd be, you know, the, the local currency return on digital property is going to be 180, 200, 300% a year. Like what is, what does the number look like in Turkish lira or Argentine pesos right now for Bitcoin over the last 12 months? It's probably Very pretty good. ridiculous, right? Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Well, what are your thoughts on inflation uh, moving forward? Where do you see it going? Do you see us sticking around the 15, 20% range uh, for the next few years or going higher or lower? Or do you just not know much about the future and prefer not to speculate? That's a perfectly acceptable answer, by the way. You know, um, on inflation, you know, what I, I, a couple of points. One, one thing I, I said today on Twitter, as I said, there's four big myths. The first myth is it's CPI. The second big myth is that it's even a single number. The third big myth is it's caused only by monetary policy. And the fourth big myth is that it can be cured by manipulating the interest rate. And I think that people have misconceptions about all those things on inflation. It's, it's caused by, by uh, unhealthy policies of government, by, by the government meddling in the economy in an unhealthy fashion. That's what causes inflation in the same way that inflammation is caused by unhealthy chronic practices in your personal life, right? And and if you continue them, the inflammation continues. And if you continue with the government engagement with the economy, the inflation will continue. And you can't just stop it by raising interest rates to 15%, right? If, if, we, if we jacked all the interest rates through the roof tomorrow, as long as there are tariffs and there are, you know, there are labor controls and there are manufacturing controls and there are travel controls and there are other government edicts and medical interventions. Those things, even without money printing, if the money supply didn't expand at all, you still have inflation, right? If you do the simple thought test, if the money supply was constant and I pretty much made it illegal for anybody to work except on Tuesday and Thursday, the price of everything goes up. Right. If I say that you have to have a seat in between you and the next person on an airplane, the price of the ticket doubles. You know, there is there are also every single every single edict drives inflation. And you know, we have more of them than in our lives, right? Never in our lives have we seen so much government engagement with the economy. And that's what's called the inflation rate. If I want to so so with that as a caveat, right? Since there is, there is no one number, the closest thing we can get to one number is a single, a single uh, number for the rate of monetary inflation, the cost of capital. If we simply liquidated all the capital in the civilization and we reduced it to dollars and we said, at what rate are we inflating that index? And I guess, I guess I'm persuaded it was 7% for the, a decade for, in the US and Western Europe from 2010 to 2020. I think, um, you know, safe, it, this is interesting. If I look at, if I look at the S&P index, it was about 
for that time period. It's 13% right now, but we, we include this massive hike 2020 before COVID, about 10%. And I got to figure 7% was monetary inflation, 3% was some kind of productivity or something. That's my best guess. And if I look at it right now, in the past 12 months, we've got 23%, 24, almost 24% on the S&P index. And that means at least 20%, 21% monetary inflation. That doesn't account for the dilution from issuing an excessive debt and equities in the S&P 500. So if you allowed for that, then you could, you could make an argument that we've got monetary inflation equal to the S&P or, or slightly, but we're looking at monetary inflation in the Western world tripling. And if I look forward the next four years, I, there's no circumstance under which you can't, you, you wouldn't consider it's got to go at double the rate it was from 2010 to 2020. So it's minimally 15% a year, I figure. And then it's, Logic says between 14 and 22% is the best guess. And, yeah. I, and, and I, I would allow for a little bit of flexibility there. Like I, I would swear no chance it's going below 14%. No chance. But, but uh, you know, if you're a pessimist, you would say 22, 23%. And if you're an optimist, you'd say 14%. And then you would say maybe, and then you would say that for four years, and then maybe we'll get to some taper 2024 between 2028, and maybe we can taper from 14 to 12 to 11 to 10. But, you know, at the end of the decade, could we get back to being, to inflating at 7%? Right? May, that would be success, right? And, and the catalyst for that would be digital transformation of the economy. Maybe digital, you know, the, the growth of digital property, a la Bitcoin, the digital transformation of everything else of assets, the digital transformation of products, a massive, what we're really, we're distorting the economy so much though, that we're really ch changing the definition of GDP. And uh, maybe even the, I mean, for example, if no one goes to a movie theater ever again, and if we eliminate 90% of business travel, then both of those are deflationary. And we could say we have more business meetings and we watch more movies, but the economy will contract. So I think that that, that will start to come into play. It's like, that's like a hedonic adjustment in a way. like. It's, it's not that different than your sirloin steak became soy burger or like meat, meat derivative product, something. But, you know, it's been so long that we forgot that we ever had the other thing. So we don't know to miss it. I think we'll see some of that when you get out, when you get out more than a decade, that's what makes this really difficult. But I, I think you want to plug in a number, plug in 14%. But now, I think that the wild card here is <clears throat> that's in the United States and Western Europe. But I really think that what we're seeing is the system cracking in, uh, on the fringe in Turkey, in Argentina, in, in all South America. You know, the interest rates in Brazil are what, right? 9% right now? And the interest rates in Turkey have been 16, 15. So I think that uh, in the developing world, you're going to see something different, right? If, if the U.S. inflates at 14%, what people haven't really factored in is that everywhere else, they're inflating 20% to 30%. And the question is, what are the consequences? And I think, I think there are two really big trends, right? Which is people are going to snap up digital currency if it's available as much as they can get their hands on. And they're going to snap up digital assets, a la Bitcoin. And not, it won't be like everybody, because to your point, there's so much stubbornness. There's so much inertia, right? You're really telling me that people are believing in the Lebanese local currency, even today. 
Yeah. It was it was stunning. Like one of these blogs that I follow, which generally has semi decent analysis on economics, so they're anti price controls and stuff. They were saying the Lebanese lira is the most undervalued currency in the world, and it should be at twelve thousand. And I've heard from many friends that a lot of people had sold their dollars at certain points. Uh, you know, at three thousand, they thought oh, I was going to go back to two. At fifteen thousand, they thought I was going to get back to ten. And at twenty five, now they think it's going to go back to twelve. And uh, they could continue with it it's but you know you could call this a currency war right this is like a war so let's come back to war there's conscientious objectors to wars what what, what happens if you're against a certain war vietnam war world war one the rebel you know tar and feather comes from what we did to people that were conscientious objectors in the revolutionary war so i think when things get to be wars patriotism kicks in and you end up with the leader of the country saying it's your patriotic duty to buy the bonds and, the, and to own the currency and to sell your foreign currency, right? So I think we get some of that. <clears throat> but you know, wars also have winners and losers too safe, right? So like, like every, every, at the beginning of World War I, everybody was on their side and they, and they had a lot of conviction, but at the end of the day, the war did end and there was a winner and there were losers I mean, everybody struggle, but I think that here, what what will what we see is we see this um, this conflict. But I, I think it's important. Like, it's important if you want to be effective. If you want to be effective and and uh, and maintain your sanity and not get distracted, it's important to frame the war as the conflict between currencies. And the conflict between assets and ultimately the struggle is the dollar versus the peso and the lira and that's gonna and that's nation states jockeying with each other and ultimately there's going to be a call you know to the state department by the president of a country saying we don't like the digital dollar circulating around here stop it right like what what is the united states what's the secretary of state going to say if the president of of a nation that's got a currency which is dollarizing or collapsing calls and complains to the ambassador and that's going to become a geopolitical thing right maybe we don't like that but leave that that's above our pay grade right like it's it's better for it's better for turkey and argentina and Brazil and Venezuela to work it out with the United States and the diplomats in foggy bottom is how they want to deal with that currency issue. Um, and then the other war, the struggle is going to be Bitcoin versus, you know, stocks and equities versus real estate, REITs versus gold versus commodities. Right. And, and that's going to be a hard fought one. And there's there's a hundred trillion dollars at stake in both of those struggles for the next decade, right? That's going to play itself out. But if you really think of it like that, then if you want to be effective, you know, let the diplomats sort through the issue of currencies, right? That's their job. And then if you're an evangelist or or an educator in the world of Bitcoin. Focus upon explaining to people why it's better for you to buy Bitcoin than buy a house in Istanbul. It's better to buy Bitcoin than buy a bar of gold. Right? Help, help with those things, you know, because ultimately you can win that one. Right? That, that, that's, a, that's a battle you can win. And you got you to choose your battles and choose battles you can win that make you stronger. Right, you don't start by picking a battle you can't win that you don't even need to fight. So, what are your thoughts on small businesses? Um, you, you've mentioned Tahini's restaurant, Bitcoiner's favorite Middle Eastern restaurant, uh, adopting the Bitcoin standard. Do you have any tips in general for small businesses what they should do? Well, I mean, you design define your treasury strategy and and have a have um a savings account and a checking account. So I would keep somewhere between one month to one year's cash flows in uh, 
in the currency that uh, that most of your costs are denominated in. So if I had liabilities in dollars or Canadian or euros or whatever, I'd keep a balance in those liabilities. And then all the excess capital you have, I'd sweep into Bitcoin. And I'd sweep cash flows in excess. Of, like we, are, we have a target number. Normally it's like 50 million. And if, you know, I'm always talking to my finance people. Are we more than 50 million? Do we have a little bit of extra, you know? And then we sweep the extra into Bitcoin. And then um, otherwise, if you're a small business, look, if, if you can um, negotiate a credit line against, uh, against Bitcoin, it doesn't hurt to have one. You know, Silvergate Bank gave a credit line uh, and issues credit lines to people like Marathon, the Bitcoin miner, and they can borrow money against Bitcoin. So if you have a credit line against Bitcoin and you, and you can establish a banking relationship, at some point that could be interesting. The other thing is, if you're in an inflationary environment, once you've adopted a Bitcoin strategy, you have a use of proceeds for capital. If you didn't have a use of proceeds for capital, then selling equity is dilutive. But if you have a use of proceeds for the capital that actually has a higher theoretical return than the growth rate of your business, then selling equity is accretive. Like MicroStrategy sold equity. We sold, you saw just this week, I announced we sold $82 million of equity and we bought $82 million of Bitcoin. Now for 20 years, we didn't really sell much equity. And the reason why is we didn't really need the capital. So we'd just be diluting our EPS and diluting our cash flows. But if, you're, if your small business is going to grow at 10% a year, and you think Bitcoin is going to grow at 40% a year, then if you sell equity at a fair price and you convert it to Bitcoin, then in fact, you're actually strengthening your balance sheet and you're increasing the growth rate of your business, right? You just quadrupled it, right? In theory, if you basically sold equity equal to your entire company and put it in Bitcoin, you just did a merger with a company growing at Bitcoin rate 160% a year with your small business growing 5% a year. Okay, so that's, uh, MicroStrategy did that, right? We took a $500 million company with 500 million in capital growing 0% a year, and we turned it into a $500 million company growing 5% or 10% a year with $6 billion of capital growing 160% a year, right? So that's the Bitcoin strategy. So I think small businesses, if they can raise equity or if they can raise debt, like uh, if I, again, if I was a doctor's practice or a dentist practice or a restaurant, you know, if you could borrow money against that at a reasonable term and convert, and convert it to Bitcoin, I would do that. I would finance my equipment. I would finance my real estate. I would, I would finance my cash flows and I would do it with any combination of debt or equity. Now, the caveat here is anytime you do a financial transaction like that, you got to find a counterparty you trust that isn't a vulture, right? I mean, you could do an equity raise where you thought you were getting a good deal, but they insert a clause that says, if you don't show up to work on Tuesday, we get to seize your business and everything, you know? So, and I, you know, I, I once borrowed money uh, to buy, to lease some computer equipment. And I thought it was good terms, like 6% or 4% interest. And when the, uh, when the lease came due, there was a clause in the lease that required that we return all the computer equipment with all of the plastic face, face plates in perfect order with the serial numbers intact. And the face plates were worth like 15 cents. And one of and they've been removed like three years earlier and thrown away. And so the bank basically tried to hit us with like a four or five million dollar penalty cost, which would have tripled the cost of the lease. Because on page 98 of the lease, we were supposed to return a 15 cent faceplate with a three thousand dollar computer. So my caveat here is assuming you know how to do these equity transactions and assuming you can borrow the money from someone you trust that is not a loan shark, then you should take the capital and you should buy Bitcoin. If you don't know how to do that, you're in over your head, right? You'll probably just hurt yourself.
So, uh, I mean, it's always possible to snatch defeat from the jaws of victory through poor execution. So. <laughs> That's extremely valuable information. I really appreciate it. I think uh, a lot of people will benefit from learning these lessons. Um, Dorian has a very good question for you, which is, have you considered taking on debt in currencies other than the dollar, since you think that they're uh, getting inflated faster? And I think I agree. Uh, wouldn't it make sense to use all of your uh, businesses abroad and uh, lever up on uh, It's an interesting this? thought, actually. Um you know, I, I'd have to talk to my finance people. Like in theory, if we could take on on debt in uh, in weaker currencies, like a credit line, that is a good idea. Well, I think yeah. we've just been focused on other things, but it, uh, but it is good uh, if you can get it to the a size that's material to be worth the trouble. Yeah. All right, well, you have to poach Dorian from my website. He works on my website. Now we have to enter a bidding war on him. Um, but uh, <laughs> yeah, very. Um, I give you points. Very creative. <laughs> Excellent. Very creative. <laughs> Excellent. All right, Marquita has a question for you. Marquita, you want to uh, go ahead and ask it? Hey, guys. Um, yep. So my question was, in the mobile wave, you predicted um, the dematerialization of certain industries like retail, um, books, education, et cetera. Sorry for the background noise. Um, when are you going to write a book that will help to explain <laughs> Um, how we'll get into more digital finance and the demonetization of property and assets. All the things you talk about and evangelize about because um, I'm certainly waiting for it. <laughs> yeah, I mean, may, thank you. I'm flattered. Uh, maybe at some point I'll be able to settle down and write a book. I've just been really busy. I've, you know, this, I think, I think Safe has kind of got the book thing cornered. He's... <laughs> You know, whenever I have a choice, whenever anybody asks me, I give them the Bitcoin standard and maybe I'll give them the fiat standard. I think he's done a pretty good job. So it, if I were to write a book, I might it might be like derivative to him and then it would be kind of dilutive. So I, I think uh, most of the people that I'm targeting, like the politicians and the billionaires and the corporate executives, they have like one book in them, you know? I, you know, they say, what should I read? I said, read the Bitcoin standard. But if I said, read that plus the, uh, my book or the third book, I don't know that they would get around to the second or the third one. So I'm going to promote Saifedean's book for, uh, for the time being. And, uh, and I am flattered. Maybe at some point, if I feel like there's something unique to say, but right now the world moves pretty fast and you kind of, you know, I kind of feel like my best role is to put things into like two minute sound bites on Twitter and hope that I can get that to run a few hundred thousand times. And then I see Newt here. Newt wrote a pretty good book too. There's actually really good authors in the Bitcoin community. I'm going to do my best to promote them. And, uh, and yeah, we'll you, you, leave it at that. you make money and we write books. That's a good deal, I guess. <laughs> yeah. But thank you. All right. Uh, Browning, you have a question? Um, I have a couple of questions. And the first one is, uh, do you think Bitcoin is money? Yeah, I do think Bitcoin is money. Um, <clears throat> I think but I think you can conceptualize Bitcoin as digital gold, as digital property, as digital money, as digital energy. All of those are reasonable metaphors. And if money is, uh, you know, money is the uh, is the universal most desirable commodity that we use to exchange value, right? It, in theory, it could become the unit of account and the medium of exchange and the store of value for all the capital and the civilization. And if I had to pick one thing to capitalize the civilization, I would say Bitcoin. Like, if there's five hundred trillion dollars worth of stuff in the world right and i was trying to figure out where the where the you know i think money is energy money is monetary energy it's economic energy liquid energy in the civilization and and uh if i'm looking for a container to hold the energy i think it's bitcoin that's the best container i think i i just i will distinguish that I think in a hyperinflation in the pure austrian economic world where you had a single sound money that like the gold coin in the theoretical world, if we if we lived in the idealistic world, then uh, the currency would be equal to the money, would be equal to the store of value, is equal to the unit of kind. It's all equal. But I think uh, 
I, I'm not sure we've ever had that. For example, like even if you go back to the Civil War, you had the greenbacks versus the gold coin. And I think for the last 10,000 years, there's always been like a ledger credit account, which is kind of like weaker money. And then there's always a stronger base layer money. And then, you know, at some point there's the paper money that's not worth anything anymore. So I think that generally when there are nation states involved, political entities, or anytime there's a strong, it's not just a nation state, by the way. If you look at the history of robber barons, right, there are the stories of like the robber barons would set up a mining town and then they would create their own monetary system of credits where they would credit the worker. And then the worker could only spend that credit in the company store. And so companies created their own money and, uh, and the like. So I think that whenever there's a powerful entity, they create a currency that's weaker than the base layer uh, store of value money. And then the currencies, in, invariably what you end up with is a currency is a medium of exchange that is uh, inflationary and it's losing value and it's constrained. And then there's a store of value asset that uh, will hold an, an accrete value over time. The, the money decomposes into property and currency, we'll say. And I think right now, Bitcoin is really the property component of money. And then the, and, uh, the currency, you know, the US dollar is like the currency component of money. And in a hyperinflating economy like uh, Venezuela, you know, there's still a currency, it's just collapsing. And then there's a property, but then in the middle, what's interesting is that if the dollar is sitting in Venezuela, it looks like a store of value to the pay, uh, to the Venezuelans because the dollar will hold value for like mm -hmm. three to seven years or three to 10 years. Mm -hmm. And the Venezuelan Bolivar will hold value for three to seven weeks or, or less. And then Bitcoin will hold value for three centuries. And so I almost look at these assets as having a different time a different half-life like that like what's the half-life of your money and i would say the half-life of bitcoin as money is forever and the half-life of the dollar as money 10 years ago was 10 years mm -hmm. and the half-life of dollar as money today is three years three years yeah right and, and so if you think about and the half-life of uh of the bolivar is money might be three weeks or three days. I don't know. But if we, if we start thinking about these assets in that way, then I think it's kind of helpful because what you realize is there are very powerful political interests that will designate one asset. And, and as long as that interest, as long as they exist, as long as the United States exists, they will have some influence. But you don't have to, you don't have to be a victim to uh, to uh, what is the word to the I, the orthodoxy that there can only be one thing that's money. Once you understand that there are three things that can be money, then you can simply mix your portfolio with a mixture of a little bit of the weak one, a little bit more of the mid one, and a lot of the good one. And I think that's a very helpful metaphor for people. Do Do you think that that Bitcoin as digital energy is the most important attribute of Bitcoin or the most forward thinking concept about it right now? I think I, th by the way, I ran this survey on Twitter. I don't know if you saw, I asked people, I, do you think Bitcoin, I asked, is Bitcoin digital gold, digital property, digital money, or digital energy? Oh. It's like on my Twitter. It's very interesting. Okay. So here's what I, what I think. I think that the most powerful concept is energy That's and digital think. energy. Yeah. Uh, because I think, that, um, I think that the entire universe is made of energy. Like if you, the earth is energy, a building is energy, matter is energy. And I think that energy is a more powerful idea than matter. Matter is a, yeah. static, a static instantiation of energy, but energy is the pure idea. So... If matter is energy and energy is matter, then energy is the highest, you know, cleanest, purest, most useful form. You know, what we talk about money, money is money is capital as energy. Or, you know, mm -hmm. as 
I can look at all the capital stock in the society and say all the buildings, all the companies, all the products, all the commodities, that's one view of the capital stock. And the other view of the capital stock is all the money and they should balance sort of in some way. And I could look at the world as saying it's all the matter in the, in the world. And then I could uh, snap my fingers and I can turn it into energy, right? And then I could turn it back into matter. And mm -hmm. that's what Einstein told us. So mm -hmm. I, th I think that once you understand it as digital energy, then you realize that it's a lot more than a store of value. If I, if I wrap myself in, like right now, if I wrap myself in digital energy, I could move through cyberspace with, uh, with greater substance and, uh, and creditworthiness. Like, I think that the solution, for example, to cybersecurity is, is everybody has to post a certain amount of Satoshis as their credit as their credit deposit or their security deposit. And then whenever you hit a website or DM someone or show up to a meeting or, uh, or you post an offer or you make a comment, then you have that security deposit. And then if you break the rules, like you lie or try to cheat someone, then so you would get fined by that platform, like a speed speeding ticket or the like. And in that world, uh, in that world, that Bitcoin on a lightning rail becomes digital energy, which provides cybersecurity at the speed of light. And, and it's a very big idea, a lot bigger idea than I'm just going to store money in digital property instead of in a house, right? It's like- so That might be worth a short book. It's like, if I, wanna, if I want to give, uh, form and substance and and uh, if i want to give um consequence in cyberspace then i need digital energy right now uh right now there are no consequences to bad behavior so there are a billion malicious attacks an hour and there are no consequences and uh one of the problems is because we can't convey uh, digital energy in cyberspace, but it's probably, it's, it's beyond the scope of a quick answer. Mm -hmm. I would say right now, coming back to my survey, most people like 40% thought digital gold that resonated with them. Mm -hmm. So digital gold is the narrative that the public is ready to embrace. And that would make Bitcoin 10 to 20 times bigger than it is right now. You can argue that digital gold is easily takes you from a trillion to $20 trillion market cap. And maybe that's fine, right? So we can basically double three more times or four more times before we outrun that idea. Digital property is the idea that we dematerialize every building and all the land and everything you could possibly own as a store of value. And that's a bigger idea than digital gold. But Digital energy, uh, digital money is, it's even more powerful than digital property, right? It's like all the economic energy. Uh, and so that's a more powerful idea. People don't really appreciate money right now. You could almost say that since 1971, there's been a attack, like a psychological ops attack on the value of money, like where... Mm -hmm. The political system attempts to undermine the value of money. I mean, money's gotten a bad name because what is money? If it's the dollar and the dollar loses 7% of its value a year for 50 years, then, I, I, then the idea that money is valuable has been kind of systemically undermined for two generations almost. But uh, if money was properly understood, sound money, then sound money would appreciate in value and yeah. uh, then, then um, once you understood it as sound money, you're like, well, sound money means digital property that's reasonably liquid for commerce. It's a medium of exchange and not just a store of value. Mm -hmm. And I think that takes it from a hundred trillion dollar type value proposition to two hundred fifty trillion dollar or more value proposition. But I think digital energy takes us to the next step, which is, if I want to construct anything with substance in the universe, I need energy. And the ability yeah. to move and store energy, to break it down to any scale, move it at the speed of light, and do it without friction. Yeah, it's I amazing. Think, 
that's worth 500 trillion or more. That's, that's worth half of the civilization, <laughs> presumably. Hope. Yeah, uh, thanks. If we had digital, inter you know, everything on the internet is digital information. Like Google and Facebook and Apple, they're moving digital information around. If we had digital energy, the significant, what's the difference between energy and information? Information is non-conservative and energy is conservative. So if we had digital energy that, that respected the laws of conservation of energy, and it was truly conservative, at the point you've implemented conservation of energy in cyberspace, you would be able to elevate the safety and the civility and the efficiency and the trust of all discourse in the civilization. So digital energy is kind of critical to, to the next step in the world because you need 100 million businesses trading with 8 billion people at the speed of light for free with trust. And they can't do it with digital information alone. Right? You, can't, you can't trust anything. I can't even open my DMs on Twitter or Instagram without 99% of the shit in my DMs is malicious bots or spam or scam. Do you know that we control. actually, we take down 20, 20 to 25 uh, malicious spam bots on Google every hour. People keep posting on Twitter. They're like, you know, someone's impersonating you on YouTube and why haven't you taken that down yet? It's like, well, I did 37 minutes ago. Like literally every hour, there are 20 of these things get spun up. And, you know, they show 18,000 people listening to Michael Saylor giving away free Bitcoin advice and giving away Bitcoin. There's legitimately 18,000 like spam bots and Google can't stop them. And if it costs you, say, a $30 security deposit, then you'd have to post, you know, $60,000 and you would lose $60,000 every time we reported you. And that stuff would stop in a hurry if there was a $30 fine per, yeah. per malicious fake person. And so you could, you could literally monetize all that malicious behavior and you could, you could shut down 99.9% .9 of the, the hostility online. And that's just one little example, but of course you can't imagine just how much inefficiency there is in the world because of a lack of trust or the fact I that, I imagine. I'm sure you do. I'm sure you imagine it. Yeah. I do. I yeah. Remember. So I, I guess I would say digital energy is the most powerful idea, and I, I'm a big fan of it because it's apolitical. Yeah. Right. See, I, I'm not a big okay. fan of digital money because it's political, yeah. and digital currency is it. Digital currency is going to be the province of every of every government. And so if you wish to wrest control of the currency from the government, it is, you know, it is literally a revolutionary idea. You're not going to do well with the mainstream and it's going to be a difficult road to hoe. So if you said what I've got is digital energy, what will it do? It will improve your efficiency by a factor of a million and bring safety and civility to cyberspace and protect your children from being molested by pedophiles and stop terrorism online and stop criminal behavior and stop con men and protect the investing public. There's nobody that's going to object to the idea of doing those things. Did, I mean, the Chinese government would agree with that. Every government would agree with that. Even at some point you would even have the Koreans and the Cubans, they won't agree on digital property, but they could probably agree on digital energy. Like name someone that doesn't, that wants to outlaw fire and electricity in their country or steel. Like it, there are communist societies that outlaw property. Everybody outlaws private currency, right? Yeah. But nobody outlaws energy. <clears throat> and so I, I think that it's, it's not just the most powerful intellectual idea. It's the most powerful political idea and the most powerful marketing idea. If you want to, to spread this technology to the four corners of the earth as rapidly as possible. And also it, uh, 
it's a lot it's a lot clearer narrative i think than the web 3.0 thing right it's like what <laughs> What I want to do is I want to go from the internet, which was a layer of digital information to the next generation, which is a layer of digital energy overlaying digital information. And who's the winner? Google, Facebook, Amazon, Apple, they can all be winners. Twitter can be a winner. YouTube can be a winner. Every government can be a winner. Who's the loser? This is, the, this is probably the single most important point. My, my number one question. If you, if you properly explain Bitcoin as digital energy, who's the loser? There's nobody. There's no reason anybody needs to be a loser. Only people you know, offering inferior horse and buggy technologies that just don't work so well. And I think that that's, that's the key for us. We should, we should communicate to people the technology promise here because technology is apolitical. And it's a universal, universally desirable thing everywhere in the world and always will be. And everything else you want to, everything else you want to say, you could probably say through the lens of technology. Other questions? Uh, David has a question for you. David, you want to go ahead? Yeah, sure. Thanks, uh, guys. So, Michael, and, and just to that point as well, I think that the correlation also between Bitcoin and time there's a very big correlation in that people basically take their time, exchange it to work at a day job. And as they create inflation, you work twice as hard for the same dollars. So they're actually robbing time, which is, I would argue, the most valuable asset, even probably more than energy, because you never get the time back. Um, so I think it's super interesting. Um, my question was with regards to purchasing crypto assets, uh, primarily Bitcoin, as opposed to the option of also mining for Bitcoin and basically purchasing the hardware to acquire that Bitcoin. Uh, and then with that, uh, a follow-up to that is the um, correlation between the miners and the pricing of those miners. So are they setting the price of Bitcoin, setting with the hash rate, the complexity? Uh, are, they, are they partially in control of Bitcoin price based off the, the mining? Um, I don't really, I don't buy the notion that there's any correlation between hash rate and price of Bitcoin. I think that that hash rate determines the security of Bitcoin, uh, but I don't see it. And it determines how competitive Bitcoin mining is, but I don't really see it as, as having any serious impact on the price. When Bitcoin's hash rate decreased by 50% or 100%, uh, when it was cut in half, I didn't see Bitcoin as less valuable. Uh, and if it doubled, I, I, I think anything within an order of magnitude feels pretty secure to me. So I don't really get caught up in that. Um, with regard to mining versus buying it, let's just say there's, there's a, a, a million ways to get Bitcoin. If you're a dentist, you can uh, fix teeth, take cash flow and buy Bitcoin. If you're a doctor, you can set bones, take the cash flow by Bitcoin. <clears throat> if you're a country, you can print your currency by Bitcoin. If you're a company, you can sell your product and buy Bitcoin. If you're a miner, you can mine for Bitcoin. If you are a semiconductor company, you could create SHA-256 ASIC chips, compete with Bitmain, sell them to miners, take the cash flow and buy Bitcoin. Um, I, I tend to think that mining is one of the most competitive industries in the world. Right, it's almost by design, right? It's totally open, globally competitive, no monopolies. No government's gonna pass a law giving you a monopoly on Bitcoin production in the world. Uh, your odds of getting a monopoly, you know, for your restaurant or, or for, your, uh, for your hospital or for your power company are much higher. So you're competing in a brutal fashion against everybody else. Um, I tend to think that everybody ought to figure out how you can best generate cash flows to buy or how you can max out the amount of Bitcoin you can buy. For example, with Saifedean, if he writes books, I would say, write good books, sell the books, convert the cash, buy Bitcoin. I wouldn't, if Safe said, should I write another book or should I teach or should I start a Bitcoin mining company? I would say probably 
you know, generally, I, I believe in capitalism. I think Bitcoin's all about capitalism. And really, the, the ethos of capitalism is you need to be the best in the world in your niche of what you do. If you're going to be a restaurant, you better be the best restaurant of that type in your neighborhood. And if you are, then maybe you'll make money, but maybe you won't make money. There's all sorts of existential risks, right? Maybe your restaurant will get forcibly shut down, right? So you have risks in every business. There are risks in mining. Um, if you can raise lots of capital, mining is a capital intensive industry. If you can raise a lot of capital cheap, then that would be a good reason to go into Bitcoin mining. If you have a lot of rigs, that's a good reason to be mining. I, if you had energy, I don't, if it was free, maybe, but, ener but the truth is energy is really the tail wagging the dog here. <clears throat> the world's full of too much energy and energy is only like one, two, three percent of the proposition. Um, if you become a miner and you buy power from somebody else and they cut you off, they can destroy you. So, so it's a risk factor. But if you told me I have energy at two cents a kilowatt hour forever, should I be a Bitcoin miner? Not necessarily. If, you're, if you can't raise capital, you're still going to get wiped out. Right now, there's politics, there's capital, there's execution, et cetera. So I like Bitcoin mining. I think it's good business. I also think it's going to get, uh, I also think that it's a, a business that, that uh, calls for a very aggressive business strategy. Like you want to get big fast, like raise billions of dollars of capital and buy up all the other miners and buy up all the equipment and then raise billions of dollars of more capital. And I know there's, um, there's the Bitcoin ideal, which is we want uh, distributed mining and okay, I'm in, I'm okay with that, but I just see that when you see someone with three football fields full of mining rigs, Right, and they're engineering this stuff. You know, you, you start to think this is getting to be a very scale intensive, capital intensive business. So <clears throat> I don't think that um, I would go into that business unless you really knew what you were doing. I it just, I would just evaluate every business opportunity. Right. It, well, it would companies like uh, Compass Mining or Blockstream, where they're basically data centers, and then you can bring your hardware there where they supply the hardware. Well, you're splitting the returns with them. You're the limited. Here's, here's the issue, right? Like Bitcoin is like the best thing in our lifetime. You could own the property and be the general partner of the property of full property rights. Or you can buy a, a share. Uh, you could be a limited partner in someone else's business. So do you want to be a half part? Do you want to be partners with someone else in a speculative business that has risk that may or may not pay off? Like, like for example, do you want to be a franchisee to McDonald's or do you want to be McDonald's? Like, like, um, do you know, I, I used to work, I did consulting work for McDonald's. And if you did the analysis after you did the conclusion, you concluded that running restaurants is really not a good industry to be in. It's not a good business. You don't make that much money uh, at the end of the day. And in fact, all the profit of McDonald's was based upon the real estate leases and the fact that they were assigned long-term leases with their franchisors that they couldn't get out of. They had a monopoly on the lease. So, so McDonald's had 20,000, 30,000 limited partners and uh, and the limited partners are want to they want to be their own business, right? So so your family, you want to be in business, you want to be a Bitcoin miner, but you don't want to run your own data center. So you go ahead and you sign up with someone else. You're like a McDonald's franchise. Uh, is that a good idea? I, I don't. Know. Maybe would I do it instead of buy Bitcoin? No, like. I would, I would buy the Bitcoin because if you own Bitcoin, you've got your own franchise. You own X percent of the dominant monopoly monetary network and you're the property owner. So you're, you have to consider what am I surrendering in order to do the other thing? And so 
if you have a billion dollars and you have to invest in securities, then you go buy Bitcoin miners because you don't have a choice. Your choice is to invest in non-Bitcoin companies or invest in Bitcoin companies, right? So Bitcoin miner is better than not a Bitcoin miner. But that's because you have a billion dollars of strategic capital and you can't move it anywhere else. But if you had a billion dollars and you could buy Bitcoin with it, buy the Bitcoin, right? Now, if you're, a, if you're wanting to start a company and take it public, you probably can't start a company to buy Bitcoin and take it public, but you can start a Bitcoin miner and take that public, you see? So, so uh, you got to ask the question, what are you trying to accomplish? My view is the most valuable property in the universe is Bitcoin. The second most valuable property in the universe presumably is a Bitcoin mining rig that's producing right now. And then after that, you've got these concentric circles. Uh, after that, you can own companies that are Bitcoin companies, but they're competitive with each other. Some can win, some can lose. And then you can own non-Bitcoin companies, right? And then some are better than others. So, you know, it, I, I guess uh, my answer to your question, it depends on what your question is, really. Well, uh, if, if you caveat have, like, emptor is what I would say generally to everything. Right, like if you had a million dollars and you could either buy it today or you could put a million dollars towards mining hardware today, three years from now, when your hardware becomes somewhat obsolete from uh, a computation. If I had a million dollars, I'd, I've already answered that for you. I'd buy the Bitcoin. Okay. If I, had, if I had a million dollars of cash, there's nothing I would do with it other than buy Bitcoin, right? Bitcoin is the theoretical apex asset of the human race. The theoretical return on Bitcoin is, is higher than anything else. Everything else is dilutive. You know, you could take your million and you could invest in a Bitcoin miner and you could wake up and the hash rate could increase by a factor of 10 and the guy that actually did the deal with you could steal your rigs. Okay, then where does that leave you? I mean, the point is you've got counterparty risk, you've got hash rate risk. You could you can invest it in Kazakhstan and find out the government of Kazakhstan put a, like a triple windfall capital gains tax on your Bitcoin mining. So, so you've got political risk, you've got execution risk, you've got technical risk. You've got all sorts of risks and against that, maybe there's a return, but is the risk adjusted return higher than buying Bitcoin? I don't think so. If Bitcoin goes to zero, your Bitcoin mining investment goes to zero. If Bitcoin mining goes to the moon, then some Bitcoin miners will be successful and some will not be successful. And some might be more successful than the Bitcoin and some might not, but who knows, right? That's just a complicated issue. Yeah, I, I guess, uh, in, in my opinion, I think pe when people ask about mining as if it's just a one uh, thing where there is a clear answer, whether it's better than or worse than Bitcoin, then th I don't think they've really looked at all the complexities involved and all the potential. I mean, it, it comes down to the cost of your power primarily, but also all these other factors that my, Michael has mentioned. And you've got um, energy you risk, political risk, yep. hardware risk, execution risk, counterparty risk, tax risk, all those things. And you don't have any of those things if you buy the Bitcoin. With Bitcoin, you just have to avoid exactly. like losing it. Right. And, and, and with a lot of miners, what they say is basically it's only viable at the two extremes. Either you get one small miner you put at home if you have very cheap electricity or free electricity in your apartment, or, you know, you become one of these very public big miners. It's the miners in the middle that really struggle the most, you know, an operation with a couple of dozen rigs or whatever, a couple of dozen machines or uh, something like that. That's where it gets really hard. Uh, Knut, do you have a question? Uh, yeah. Uh, first of all, thanks for the compliments, Michael, and uh, great to finally talk to you. <laughs> uh, uh, I have a completely off-topic question. Uh, I've been thinking about it since since I heard the story about you moving money out of Argentina, I believe, by buying a yacht. I didn't uh, buy the yacht. I tried to buy the yacht. My lawyers wouldn't let me. <laughs> All right, so so you never bought the yacht. <laughs> Why don't you just so, get new lawyers? <laughs> not so yeah, easy. My my question would have been if you were on the yacht or not sailing it to the West Indies. But since you never bought the yacht, that's uh, <laughs> uh, so I thought that was a real story. But it was just an example. Then I've heard you mention it in a couple of posts. What I said was I I suggested that and they told me I couldn't. 
Okay. <laughs> one one time I ended up losing the money, and the other time I ended up having to buy some sovereign debt from the government or so, so, some kind of technique that was uh, that was regulated, approved. But I ended up taking a haircut, you know, 10, 20, 30 percent haircut on the money to get it out, and then you never really get it all out. It's just oh, you know, all right. It is what it is. <laughs> Uh, another off-topic question then, what's the name of the ship behind you? <laughs> Do you know? No, there's no name. It's just a, it's just a, a 19th century model. It's handmade, oh, nice. but I, I think it's supposed to be sort of modeled on the Amsterdam or one of the Dutch East India's um, ships from the 17th century that they used. Yeah. Uh, why I ask, it's, it's, it's not just because of asking something else ship related because i used to work on a, on a vessel that looked almost exactly like that one a, a historical ship uh Where called called the gothenburg it was also an east india man uh uh the company who 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 ran the whole thing was called the east india company they started it up again yeah it's it's an east That's, india ship i think like yeah. part warship part cargo ship that they they ran yeah they 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 sell sail better than you think those things. <laughs> yeah. Well, thank you anyway. Um, yeah. Hey, if I if I could just clarify on that last conversation, I think that the best way to think about Bitcoin mining versus buying Bitcoin is everybody in the world has two decisions to make. One is their business strategy, and the other is their investment strategy. And the investment strategy is how do I allocate my portfolio of assets and what do I do with my free cash flows? And, and buying Bitcoin is an investment strategy. Business strategy is how do I generate cash flows? And you can have a business which is selling anything, ice cream cones, writing books, broadcast television, mining Bitcoin, mining. You can mine gold and then you can sell the gold and convert it to Bitcoin. Yeah. So the point is you can have, there's a million businesses and if you're asking, you know, what would I do? My answer is you ought to be engaged in the business that you're good at, where you have assets and you have skill, where you can compete. And then you ought to, you ought to uh, set your investment strategy, you know, based upon your risk tolerance. And I would say high quality property, digital property is best. And if you can't stomach that, you know, buy analog property or big tech stocks or real estate or something. And uh, if you if you do it that way, then I think once you ask yourself the question, am I competitive? Am I better? Am I, am I best of the best in the world? If you are, then that makes sense to do it. If you, where you really get to this acid test is, is if you have to put your own capital into the business, you have to ask the question, is this business going to give a better yield than Bitcoin? The answer is probably no. If you don't have to put your own capital in the business, if you can go to someone else and raise millions of dollars to start up a Bitcoin mining venture, then by all means, you should do it. It's someone else's capital, right? And so you're drawing capital into the ecosystem. So the, the right way to think of it is launch a Bitcoin bank like Silvergate, raise 480 million. Launch a Bitcoin miner, raise hundreds of millions. Launch a Bitcoin anything you know, raise money, bring it in the ecosystem and compete. But when you have excess cash flow, sweep them into Bitcoin. That's That would be my view on that. And if you think of it that way, then I think everything's a lot simpler. I think also to that point, the ability to depreciate the assets, which are the mining rigs. Yeah, there are a lot of business advantages, a lot of advantages to having an operating business. Right. Like you're right. Like you get, if you buy the mining rigs and you can take immediate depreciation. Yeah. Assuming you have cash flows or you have profits that you can use that against uh, tax credit against. So there's a lot of other times when it makes sense. Like if you have natural gas and you're, you have natural gas, it's stranded and you have to shut in the wells, then you should launch a Bitcoin mining business. So you don't have to shut in the natural gas. If you have a cash generating real estate company, you pair it with a Bitcoin mining company, then you could really use some of the tax benefits. Right. It's, it's just a business discussion. And one thing that I try to do is, um, I try to keep all of my commentary on just Bitcoin, like laser, like the laser eyes thing is just Bitcoin. 
I don't give you advice about what socks to buy. I don't give you my opinions about Facebook or Apple. I don't even tell you to invest in MSTR, right? You'll, if you look at every one of my tweets, I've never said buy MSTR stock. That's a security risk comes with it. There's 24 pages of disclosures, right? I mean, there's 57 pages of parade of horribles of everything that could possibly go wrong. So I, I don't really tend to want to give people business advice about what's the best business because it's a very complicated thing. It's very individual. I think you got to find your own way. What I would say is study Bitcoin, think about it really hard and then think about, you know, how does it fit into your circumstances? You have capital, you're in a country, you have business expertise, you have a reputation, you can raise certain amounts of money, figure out what's the most constructive thing you can do. And then do that thing. Fantastic. Well, this has been absolutely amazing, uh, and very, very informative and helpful. I've learned a lot. Um, and this is, uh, you know, beyond the usual, uh, massive poetry and uh, nuggets of wisdom. I think there was a lot of very practical business advice here, which I think is uh, very useful for a lot of us who have not built billion dollar companies like you, Michael. I very much appreciate your time. And I thank you so much for joining us. And I hope we do this again. Um, um, when you've bought a lot more Bitcoin, as always. Thanks. I appreciate the invitation. I will look forward to the next time safe. And thank you for everybody that, uh, that uh, went through the seminar with us. I enjoyed talking to all of you. Cheers. Take care.